evening, Demon fans, and welcome back to the Demon Land podcast. My name is Andy, and the Demons gave their opponent a six-goal head start, fought back from the brink, and then fell agonisingly short, going down to the Blues by the narrowest of margins. Joining me tonight to pick up the pieces of my broken heart is veteran Demon Lander George. Good evening, George. Good evening, Andy. Good evening to Bin Man. Good evening to our listeners. And uh, we're also joined tonight by uh, Lord Andy Ronicus, uh, an enthusiast of fair play and optical clarity, who will be providing us with some uh, insights into uh, the umpire's performance during this game. Uh, yes, for any uh, listeners who, are, who who do not frequent uh, our website, demonland.com, someone, we had a thread about umpiring and someone... Uh, uh, asked if I could uh, contact, write, I don't know, did he ask me to write a letter to the club on behalf of Demon Land to see if I, as a trusted uh, person, could sway the club into somehow then swaying the AFL into uh, perhaps giving us a better, um, you know, some better, <laughs> better umpiring. It was, a, it was an <laughs> interesting <laughs> concept. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think I could uh, I have that sway. In fact, I know I don't. <laughs> also joining us tonight to tell us why this loss isn't as bad as it looks is B-Man. Good evening, B-Man. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, George. Good evening, Demon Landers. Why is a one-point loss when we're 38 points halfway down a, the third quarter not as bad as it looks? Well, uh, it's a pretty impressive comeback. And um, I, for one, could not be prouder of uh, of the players and my team for, for that comeback. It, it just reinforced to me how good a team this is. I mean... As the three of us, we've followed Melbourne for a long time. Um, 36 points down, two minutes into the second quarter, I could, I could, exp- I could go back in the last 30 years, 30, 40 years, and pick 50 examples of something similar that we end up getting beaten by 100 points. Um, I, I thought it was a terrific performance, and of course, it's it's uh, really frustrating to lose, and would have been great to win it. Um, but you know, I just um, I, I just could not have been prouder um, of the effort of of um, the Melbourne players. How proud were you in the first quarter when they piled on five goals and we didn't score? Well, I mean, we'll get into it. But I mean, it happens. You know, I mean, it happens. It's football. I, like I don't know where we you know, how have Melbourne fans arrived at an expectation that a, a, an opposing football team that everyone had gone into the match saying is a good football team and Carlton are one of the contenders. You know, other foot, it, hap- I mean, it happened to Geelong, down at Geelong, didn't it? Ex- almost the exact same scenario happened to Geelong. Geelong were unbeaten and were, before they came into us. Everyone seems to think they're a contender. Um, what about the Giants? The Giants, you know, three weeks ago, People were saying, you know, seemed to suggest the Giants were basically, you know, the flag favourites and it was, you know, maybe them and a gap and then Swans and the rest. They gave up five, four or five unanswered goals on the weekend. Um, so, you know, proud. I mean, I, I like the implication is that I shouldn't have been proud because they had a poor quarter. I mean, I, I'm not a fair weather. My pride isn't so, fle- you know... <laughs> So, of course, I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't, you know, wasn't um, a fantastic uh, quarter to be sitting at the MCG surrounded by um, Blues fans, but um, I was really proud of the fight back and, you know, uh, that first quarter wasn't great, but it it actually wasn't as bad as it it looked and we'll get into some of the reasons why and, um, you know, but it happens. I mean, teams, they were remarkably accurate, the Blues. You know, in normal circumstance, that's 2-3, three, 3-2 three, three, tops and it's a completely different game of footy. Um, so, you know, I was less thrilled with uh, the fact that they gave up the goal, the first goal of each quarter. That was a, a huge issue for us and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But, yeah, my pride isn't so, you know, <laughs> so porous that um, I'm going to turn up, you know, my toes after a poor first quarter. No, look, uh, uh, look, I'm upset about obviously about uh, that first quarter, and I'm not. Uh, I'm. Uh, it's it's not that I'm not proud uh, or happy that we came back and we fought back and we play we played well to do that, but just 
put it, ourselves in that situation. Is, well, I was frustrated, yeah, but it's I'm, like I'm you know, I wasn't not proud of my football club because you know. a bloody good football team kicked five goals. I mean, it happens. Yeah, I just don't want to see it again. Um, well, let's uh, let's move on because we will talk uh, more in depth about it. So let's get on with the reviews. And each week I do put the call out to our loyal listeners to help us out uh, by leaving us a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts. Uh, I say it every week. We do love the feedback and we do reward our loyal listeners who take that time to provide those five stars uh, by giving them a shout-out on the show. And Felinophobe writes... Uh, Cinque Stelle, uh, uh, George. Is that um, that's five stars in Italian? I know you've been to Italy. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. <laughs> it was, I'm sure I ballsed up the uh, the pronunciation. Of that. Uh, that was pretty good. Uh, I've been attending. Uh, I've been intending to leave uh, this podcast to review for a long time, and now seems like the perfect opportunity. Many thanks for the work you three, Andy, George, and B Man, have put into this podcast over many years. The match reviews are thorough, detailed, and have given me a new perspective on football. Brilliant work. From a personal perspective, this weekend and referring to the Geelong game seems a good time to write the review. For many years, I have lived in Geelong, in the Geelong region, and their team has put us to the sword frequently. There have been notable exceptions, especially 2021. Living and working in the Geelong area, it's hard to avoid taxpayer stadium and their annoying supporters, most of whom are surprisingly nice people outside of Cardinia Park. Even from 20 kilometres outside town, a glimpse of the horrible stadium light towers is enough to trigger me. I will only attend that ground if bound and gagged. In fact, I believe I may be suffering from a medical condition, KPE, Cardinia Park Encephalopathy. Balls that one up. On the advice of medical professionals, I have had uh, I've moved out of Dodge to move to Northern Italy. The severe rashes, anxiety and uncontrollable twitching necessitated a European reboot this season. To my delight, the Demons triumphed this weekend. It could only have been better if the margin was even narrower and the game was played at Cardini Park. Keep up the great work, Felinophobe. Well, thank you, Felinophobe, for that fantastic uh, Cinque Stelle review all the way from Northern Italy. So keep that feedback coming. We really do appreciate the five stars um, on Apple Podcast. And please don't forget to click that writer review link and write that review and and as well as giving us the five stars. And we'll give you a shout out on the show. If you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and you want to leave us feedback or post a question or a comment for the show, post under our podcast uh, post each week or just slide into our DMs. We won't read out your full name on the show. Uh, we're available, Apple, Google, Spotify, SoundCloud, and also on YouTube where you can watch and listen to um, us. So uh, search for Demonland, Podco- Demonland Podcast to find the channel. Um, if you want to chat with other Demon fans, if you've never been to our forum, head on over to demonland.com, sign up, uh, and you can chat with other Demon fans from across Australia and around the world. It's completely free. Um, if you want to join us on the air tonight and you want to talk to us uh, about any of the topics we're going to talk about, give us a call on 03 9016 That's 03-9016-3666. I'll answer. I'll put you on mute and bring you on when there is a break in the conversation. You can call that number during the week, leave us a voicemail, and uh, we will play it on the show. If you're listening live, come join us in the chat room. Head on over to demonland.com slash podcast. We are live every Monday, even though today is Sunday, and I feel like I say that all the time. We keep changing. But if you do want to listen to the show, we will be live probably on Monday for the next, uh, well, probably for the rest of the year. Uh, head on over to demonland.com on Monday nights at 8.30 p.m. Now let's get into the match review. In what turned into a gripping encounter at the MCG, the Blues narrowly defeated the Demons by a single point in a match that imp- epitomize the razor-thin margins defining this this very recent rivalry. Six of the last eight encounters between the two teams have been decided by under a goal, with the Blues having pipped the Ds at the post in their last three matches. The Blues, leading throughout the game, built a formidable early advantage by scoring the first six goals. The initial burst proved critical, setting a tone of urgency and precision that the Demons struggled to match in the earlier stages. Melbourne's woes were compounded by a scoreless first quarter, a rarity for this current crop of demons. In fact, the Ds have not been held scoreless in the first quarter since 2008. It was also our first uh, uh, scoreless first quarter against the Blues since 1942. This slow start was despite frequent entries into their 450, showcasing a lack of finishing precision that's haunted them throughout the match with the Ds winning the inside 50 count 61 to 41 on the night. 
Christian Petrarca's strategic shift from midfield to forward in the second quarter ignited the Deezer offense. He delivered a standout performance, scoring five goals in what ultimately became a desperate yet unsuccessful comeback effort. Petrarca's heroics brought the Demons within a whisker of victory as his late surge in the final quarter nearly overturned what had peaked at a 38-point deficit. Accuracy in front of goal would once again prove to be the Demons' Achilles heel, ending the match with four more scoring shots and taking the moral honours of winning on the expected scoreboard on the night. The match climaxed in the final seconds with Melbourne captain Max Gorn narrowing the gap to a single point. However, Carlton's defence held firm, epitomised by Nick Newman and Patrick Quips' crucial tackle on Petrarca in the dying moments, sealing the win for the Blues. Despite the devastating loss, the Dees uh, demonstrated a capacity to challenge under pressure qualities that should come in handy come finals time but hopefully not too many head starts are given up come september anything else boys before we move on to the stats Uh, i think we'll cover it all off in the uh, when we get to the questions sandy uh, so can I do my brief comments, Andy? I'm going to I'm going to give up my brief comments time after you sledging me last week about my non-brief comments. But <laughs> uh, um, the top of the show, so you, you, you yeah. moved into your second brief comments. Yeah. So brief comments. Um, <laughs> if you could play that clip from um, Goody, because for me, I'm going to take a leaf out of his book, out of Goody's book, and he sums up for me the entire game in. Uh, the very first question he was asked at um, the post-match presser. Right, they sort of cut into it while the question's being asked, but you can get the drift. Did a weird game in the end. You guys tried for most of the night and just found something late. How do you kind of, what's your main takeaways? Well, the main takeaways, you hate losing. Um, you know, you're going to wake up feeling pretty crook about that one in terms of how we started. You know, any time you want to give a team six goals head start, you know, for that contest both ends of the ground was really poor and our defence was poor. So we gave a really good side, uh, a six-goal start, and they played really well early. You know, they were, they were hot. Um, but our responsibility as a footy club is to rock up and, and compete in a way that keeps you in a game for longer. Um, so, yeah, that's where the game was won and lost early. And um, there was a lot to like after that, but um, the damage was done. That it was. All right, we can wrap it up now. That's <laughs> there you go. That's exactly, basically, my summary of of the game. And um, you know, that I mean, we'll obviously get into the sort of starting stuff, but um, uh, we really, I, I don't think we we're that poor in that first ten minutes. We just wasted our inside fifty kicks, as Goody just suggested, and I, and I, and I just felt like the defensive system was a little bit out of sorts. Um, and and T Mac, I think he had his, you know, he's probably his not his best game for the season and certainly, you know, he was caught out a couple of times and um, so, you know, they took all of their chances. They were brilliant, let's face it. So what you mentioned expected score, but we'll, we'll touch on that later. But, I mean, they were their kicking was brilliant. So, you know, our kicking actually wasn't that bad. We were bang on our expected score. They were 24 points above what, you know, their expected score was and that's because they kicked brilliantly and that, that happened in that first quarter. So, um, yeah, I reckon Goody's got it in a nutshell just there. Oh, you caught me uh, when I muted and just stood up, but uh, you can go straight into your stats files if you would like. No worries. All right. So I, I, it was a fascinating game again. So two weeks in a row, fascinating game. And, and I reckon there's sort of a – there's an interesting um, element um, that links both games. We only play both teams once. Um, so both sets of coaches will only get that opportunity to, um, to you know, to, to set up against – potentially a team that we'll meet in the finals. And I think it's well worth considering because there's a question later that we'll touch on about their centre square setups and they were definitely really aggressive. That was definitely a part of the um, a factor in um, some of their clean exits. Uh, and I think they experimented with quite a few tactical, both um, uh, coaches and you know, Scott as well, uh, Goody in both games and, and Scott um, and Voss, with tactics with a view to playing in the finals, it's really curious that we don't play either team again. Um, and this is our chance, um, to, I guess, to sort of see how we match up on them. But by the same token, 
Goody um, and probably Voss, but definitely Goody will have kept his tactical cards pretty close to his uh, chest. So I, I think the reason I say that is I, th- I feel like that in both games there was a fair degree of experimentation by Goody, um, it, you know, definitely in this game. Um, so, uh, and I think with a view to trying different things um, going forward, but also, you know, not showing our cards that we'll, you know, want to show come, you know, a must win f- a finals game. It was a really curious game on a number of levels and, um, you know, you could really see the Blues wielding in the second half and us re- uh, resting the momentum. I said as much to my mate at the game and I, I even after we went 38 um, points down, I confidently said to him, um, I thought we were still a red-hot chance to win that game and I was almost proved correct. Um I think a key factor in the loss was when we did start getting arresting the momentum. They got a couple of goals straight after goals from us, and as I mentioned, those goals at the start of the quarter, those goal, those sort of goals really hurt. What was super impressive was most teams that lose their momentum. Um, when you've got the momentum and a team sort of gets a goal against the grain, so often teams then fold, and then you know that's the end of the match. But I, that was one of the reasons I was so proud um, of our performance in that second half because they didn't. Um, but as um, ultimately, as Goody said straight up in his presser, the game was lost going six goals down. And and I'd be guessing, this is just a pure guess, but in the history of all of the games of footy since 1852, whenever the first game that Dees played was, I reckon it'd be no better than one in 30 for teams winning after being six goals down at any point in a, a game of footy. But um, um, maybe we can get uh, one of that on the Twitter feed for, what's the fella, um, Swamp? Yeah, Sir Swamp. Uh, Sir Swamp thing. For, that might be a job for you, Andy, on the Twitter feed. Yeah, um, know, but, I don't know if he likes Melbourne because whenever I've asked him questions, and he probably gets asked a million all the time, uh, he's never answered me, but uh, I won't take uh, that. Person. Well, we'll see. Maybe that's, a, that's an interesting one. But, yeah, anyway, it's really difficult to win once you get that far down, and that's what Goody said. Um, I just Before we go on, really, I just want to make give credit to Carlton. I thought they played brilliantly in that first quarter. They were really switched on. Um, they, and they were excellent defensively. I've been critical of their defensive uh, work and they were brilliant um, defensively, but in that first half, but I wouldn't, you know, if I was a Blues fan, I, you know, I wouldn't sleep on that too much because they were terrible in the second half and almost, get, you know, to give up a 38-point lead halfway through the third quarter uh, and almost lose it, we could arguably, you know, sh- could have won it. Um, it would have been great to steal a win. That that was a pretty poor defensive second half from the Blues. It would worry me if I was a fan, but they were brilliant in that first quarter and they won some critical one-on-one battles uh, in that first quarter particularly, but also in the second quarter. Um, yeah, and and I forget, I'm not sure who was playing on Fritter, but he really gave Fritter a path in that first 10 minutes and there were a couple of critical contests and I think it was Cotterell. Cotterell did some really brilliant defensive work, including that rundown of Cozzy that disrupted him just as he was about to run into an open goal. But as I said, you know, I really couldn't be prouder. Um, one of the interesting things for me in this game was, and there's a question about um, the wet weather footy later, so I won't um, go into detail about that aspect of it, but this was a, um, a retro round for us in terms of game style. The first sort of 10 minutes or so, I, I don't know if, if you're at home watching, you, sometimes on the telly you can't see it raining, but I got there early. I got there at like 10 past six. It started raining as soon as I got there, this fine misty rain, and it didn't stop raining pretty much for most of the game. You know, the, I think the last quarter it, maybe it stopped for a little while, or but it was misty rain for, for much of the game. So it was really very tricky conditions, very slippery. Um, it I feels like to me in that first sort of 10 minutes, we were playing the way we're wanting to play the, the 24 red and blue print. That's the sort of model we were following. Lots of quick handballs. We, we actually did them all night, I thought. Um, and, you know, they in the first quarter, a lot of them broke down. But we were playing that sort of back half transition game in the first 10 minutes. But after the weather really came in, we really reverted to, um, you know, the, it felt to me like it was the 20 to 21 to 23 um, model redux. So, um, and and for me, that was really goody adapting to the wet weather. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So last year, you know, when we playing well, we these are the numbers that we would look for. So metres gain, we were plus 236 metres gain, which is amazing considering we were down um, after the first, uh, were probably level after the first quarter. We had 20 more inside 50s. 
um, and we had eight more shots at goals. They're the num- sort of numbers that we um, saw last year. This one is even more striking. Um, the first quarter was 53-47, then 50-50. Uh, second quarter, this is time in forward half, I should say, 51-49 in the third. So that's sort of the pattern that we've been looking at a bit more so far this season, but it was the last quarter where we really dominated and it felt really like a throwback to the last three seasons, uh, the way we played, 76% um, to 24% in that last quarter. So overall, it was 59 to 41%. And, you know, we could have picked this same, those numbers are very similar. Um, I meant to check uh, the last game we played them in the home and away, not the final. Uh, very similar numbers from memory, in particular that um, time in forward half was it was something similar, 75, 76 in the corresponding home and away game last year. So in many ways, it looked like the model that um, we've been playing the last couple of years. And I think it was Goody adapting to the wet weather and playing a different game. Um, but using the metrics for the, um, you know, with that in mind, using the metrics for the 24 red and blue print defence, um, opposition score, as I said, I think defensively we were poor in the first half, particularly in that first quarter. We we just seemed a little bit sort of our structures were a bit off unusually. We got caught out a couple of times. And, of course, of course that's um, hard when it's coming out so clean out of the centre. So, you know, and the question is, well, did enough pressure get put on that last kick inside 50? But nonetheless, we normally eat up those those kicks even when it's a 6-6-6, you know. So we don't give up many goals from centre clearances. Um, for instance, uh, against Richmond, we, they had 10 centre clearances. We gave up one point. Um, the Cats had eight centre clearances. We only gave up one point. So, you know... In normal circumstances, we don't give up that sort of um, score, even from a 6-6-6 clean centre um, clearance break. Um, but it has to be said their kicking for goal was absolutely brilliant. Six straight from the start of the game, 8-2 at half time. Um, but and on the defensive sort of side of it and their score, given they were 50 points at half time, you know, we did super um, well to keep them to a total of only 77. They only scored four goals in the second half. That's an impressive defensive effort from us. Um, and it really is worth noting the expected scores. I know it's not your favorite number, Andy, but they scored 75 from, or the, your favorite data point, but they scored 75 points. So that was their total. Um, they had two rushes, so 77 in total, but an expected score was 51 um, and our expected score was bang on our expect we had three rust we scored uh, rushed we scored 73 the expected score was 72.4 so it was basically our accuracy was AFL average which is impressive given how wet and slippery it was it's even more impressive how um, you know their accuracy was out of the park like that was one out of the box for them because they've been uh, relatively inaccurate this season um, you know it just shows you how much lady luck plays a part but well played to Carlton um, 75 points we win that game on expected score, not because we were inaccurate, which was the pattern last year. Um, you know, we've mentioned those games in the Pies final, in the GWS loss, in the Alice. Um, similarly to exactly the sort of conversation we're having about the expected score in the Brisbane game, Carlton won it because they were so brilliantly accurate. Um, and in particular, um, if you go on the stats file, you can see their expected score from ranges, different ranges. Their kicking from 40 plus metres was sensational. Like it was, I think, 12 or 15 points above their expected score from that distance. And they really nailed some long shots, and particularly in that first quarter. Um, here's a heartbreaking um, number. On those expected scores, uh, we would win that game 94% of the time. So that is a Melbourne number um, on that one that we've had to suffer through a fair bit in the last couple of years. Um, but again, it was their accuracy, not our inaccuracy. And I think that's an important point. Um, and, you know, all credit to the Blues for for that good kicking is good footy. Um, and you've got to pay credit for it. There are a couple of marks in that first quarter. The one to Martin, that's not a goal that we normally give up. There was I, That was directly below me. I was in the um, show. Shane Warren stand at the punt road end behind the goals and they were all over the shop structurally on that ball coming into Martin uh, and to allow him a free run to jump over the back, I think it was over the lever, was a really poor bit of defence. Um, you could tell how frustrated and annoyed Goody was um, in that presser 
Uh, and, you know, to no coincidence, he, ta- he named the sort of kicks inside 50 in our defensive uh, and our contest, which I thought our contest wasn't so bad, but obviously in that first 10 minutes, obviously um, Goody disagrees. So I'll go with his assessment of it. Um, you know, we set ourselves to win this game and he was definitely frustrated that we didn't. Mark's inside 50 was a really interesting one given Kerno and Mackay and, and it looked like they were going to mark everything in that, you know, in, uh, in that first quarter. Um, uh, De Koning also took a really good mark, that Martin mark I mentioned before. Um, but we actually, by the end of the match, we took two more marks inside 50 of them, which is pretty impressive given, you know, everyone pumps up, um, you know, quite rightly their um, forward line. But we ended up taking nine marks to their seven. They only took seven marks inside 50. So good defence by us, really good defence by us to um, keep that to seven because I reckon it must have been what, three or four in the first quarter that they took inside 50? Um, and almost that's sort of where the game went. Uh, last week, we were plus three for contested possessions. This week, minus eight. And that's not a great number. That definitely wouldn't have pleased Goody. What's important is we were 10 contested possessions down after 10 minutes of footy. Um, and which goes to the point that Goody made. We just weren't um, in that game. We didn't bring our uh, bring the heat in the ten, first 10 minutes and they took full advantage of that. Um, but from that time, um, we were uh, ended up uh, pretty much level or two, um, plus two for the rest of the game from there. Our pressure was just fantastic. It was brilliant. Um, so even in that first quarter, you know, I think – because of how you know efficient they were going forward, because of how accurate they were, you know, you might go away thinking, "Oh, we got blown away in that first quarter." But apart from that first ten minutes, we really balanced up after that, and our pressure for the quarter was one eighty six. Remembering one eighty is um, AFL average two hundreds considered elite, and they were bang on two hundred in that first quarter. Definitely, as Goody said, they brought the heat, brought the pressure, um, and you know they they deserve their lead. That's for sure. They deserve their, the win. I think second quarter um, was really interesting, and I wouldn't have guessed this um, at the ground. We were one eighty nine, and their pressure dropped right off in that quarter to one sixty three. The third quarter was nuts. This is a nuts quarter of 40, 217 to 209. And so both teams over the elite, that's how it felt at the ground. Huge effort by Melbourne. We really dialed it up. But they went with us. Credit to them. They went with us on that. Then the last quarter, and for me this is just you know, this is a crazy number um, and it shows that fatigue wasn't um, a particularly big factor in this game or if at all. Um, certainly, you know, the five-day break, we'll talk about it in a, a bit, but 221 hour pressure was um, in the last I meant, uh, in the last quarter. I meant to check. I reckon, I think we've had 225, 227, but that would be probably our highest last quarter um, and up with the highest quarter that we've had all season, which is amazing off a five-day break. They were pretty impressive in that quarter too, 201. So for the match, it was 202, remembering 200 elite to 194. Amazing game of footy. Our top five pressure players, and this is um, well worth again keeping in mind when we talk about the midfield um, a bit later. Number one, um, 92 pressure points, 40 individual pressure acts. Uh, his season average is 61.6 um, pressure points, so we got 92 Jack Viney. That's just an amazing game from um, one of our leaders. Number two, uh, Alex Neil Bullen had 32 pressure acts, 87 pressure points. His season average per pressure points is 53. So way, way over uh, his season average per pressure. Fantastic game from Nibbler. Kay Chandler had a quiet game um, in terms of disposals, but his pressure was also awesome. His season average is 49 pressure points. He had 67 pressure points in this game. Um, coming in fourth was um, Clary. Clary averages 42.6 pressure points. Um, he had 55 in this game, so another player above average for pressure. Uh, and Cozzy was um, the fifth. He had uh, also above his season average for pressure points, 27 individual pressure acts, um, 51 pressure points. His season average is 42.6. That's brilliant. Here's another indicator of our effort and um, our intent and, and the contest that we brought to this game um tackles were um we were um plus 18 uh, last week we we're plus four for tackles we were plus 11 for tackles inside 50 this week um we were plus 18 for tackles so you can't you can't question their commitment and their contest uh, and our tackles inside 50 were plus seven we had 16 tackles inside 50 we only had th- well not only we had 30 we were plus 11 last week with 13 tackles we upped it this week we had 16 tackles inside 50 
um, for seven more than uh, they could manage, which they're just awesome numbers. Another number that tells me really, like the pressure numbers, that we were fit and ready for this game. And and I'm really, you know, that again, I think we can hear in Goody's voice how frustrated he is because they had set themselves for this game. I have no question. Last week, I talked about how this was a sort of anomalous or strange number. Our ground ball numbers are lower this year. Our contest numbers are lower because of the game style we're playing. But last week, I noted that we were 12 down in ground ball gets, which was seemed to me an anomalous number in a, in a game we won. Uh, much better this week 104 ground ball gets to 106 only two down we only had 76 ground ball gets last week which is probably an indication a a big part of um sort of uh, a manifestation of the way we played last week all of all of those uncontested um possessions that we had uncontested marks so there was just fewer you know way fewer 140 what that's 140 150 grand ball gets last week and there were 210 between the two time uh, sides this week and obviously we played a different game uh style but it was wet and slippery for the entire game um our clearance numbers our total clearances um uh were for, we were down four uh, standard clearances, These are just raw numbers, not points from. So we had 10 to their 14 standard clearances, and we had two more stoppage clearances than them, 30 to 28. Uh, last week, we were plus eight for contested marks, and this week they uh, did really well in this space. And I think it was a factor in their ability to control the game, particularly in that first half. They had three more contested marks than us. I haven't seen the breakdown, but I suspect they had 12, and I suspect probably eight or nine of them were probably in that first half. Transition from back half, you know, as I said, I think we played a um, – we reverted to um, the pre- the style we've been using over the last three seasons or so this game. So you'd think that that would be reflected in the points from defensive half, and it was, but we still managed 26 from our back half. Um, we're averaging 32.6 from our back half with a, a you know, a different game that we're playing this year. Um, we're, average, we're giving up on average 24.8, and they only managed 25. So we're plus one for points from defensive half. Um, score so- sources, so this is from the transition from back half, um, sort of key indicators. Uh, season average is 43 points from turnover, 36 um, uh, in the uh, Thursday night, last Thursday night. Uh, we're averaging 39 points and uh, they could only manage 32. So that's pretty impressive in terms of our ability to stop them scoring from t- turnover. So that's a really critical score is scoring from turnover and stopping the opposition from scoring turnover. So it was a pretty strong effort in that space for us this week. This one was the one that got a lot of conversation, a lot of talk, um, and uh, the centre bounce scores. We got two goals straight from our centre bounce um, uh, clearances. They got five straight from their centre bounce clearances, um, negative 18. Um, But if you're going to focus on that, you also then got to credit our scores from stoppages. So around the ground, non-centre bounce stoppages, we scored 4-3-27 to 2-2-14, plus 13. Um, so if we'd scored seven goals straight from that, we win the game. Um, you know, that normally five threes are really anomalous, as I said before. You know, two, three, three, two, we'd expect, or not giving up, you know, more than a couple of goals from centre bounces, credit to them. And I think part of that was how aggressively both teams set up in the centre. We set up for um, quality clearances, both teams did. Um, but Plus 13 around the ground stoppages is a very impressive number. Uh, I'd be guessing it'd be one of our highest for the season. So for all the talk about our midfield, we're only five point down, points down from scores from stoppages. Um, so that was a pretty impressive effort uh, in that space. Now, finally, the last one um, was fitness, as I've been talking about all season and, and fatigue, the high performance stuff. Um, you know, I really think we were fit and firing, ready to roll in this game. Um, uh, you know, I think that physically those numbers showed, you know, we were, we ran out the game really well, much better than them. We looked like we were rolling over the top of them, uh, which is not to say I was thinking about this during the week is that, of course, it's not all physical. Um, you know, individual players, I think, you know, it's not homogenous across the group some players were gonna are gonna be impacted um, more by a five-day break and and the training and the lead up um and i think frit is one of them he looked you know he was out muscled a few times that he normally wouldn't the other one that is t-mac uh t-mac looked you know not nearly as sharp as uh, he has been which is hardly surprising five days but the you know the other factor with that i think is a psychological factor um you know sort of i think it's easy to forget 
you know, they're not robots. So five, just five days prior to this match, they had a big game, finals-like game at the G that they were, you know, pumped up to win. I think they were pumped up for this one too, but, um, you know, that they weren't, you know, that's I think Goody's frustration we can hear in his voice is they weren't mentally, you know, in the right place in that first sort of 15, 20 minutes. I thought they were at the five, first five, six minutes if we'd taken one of those chances, um, but there were some really poor entries uh, inside 50 that really hurt us. But we get one of those goals and it's a sort of a different start to the game. Um, but, yeah, I just think psychologically we weren't um, switched on, which is not to say, you know, of course a five-day break is going to uh, have an impact. Um, but, it, you know, it, for me it wasn't a sort of major factor in the result. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, it has become a bit of a theme of starting slow um, and, you know, it was definitely an issue in this game. Um, I mentioned the um, the – X expected score, um, that was a really, you know, 54.5 is what they would normally score on average. So, well played, Carlton, you know, that you have to give them credit um, um, for for playing, you know, for kicking accurately, as I've, I've said a million times, is good kicking is good footy. Uh, and that's it. That's it for Stats Files. That's it. Stats Files out. Um, all right, let's get into our listener questions. Now, we've got uh, a number of questions about a question <laughs> from comments. Oh, hello. Um, another number of questions and comments about um, the first quarter. Well, I've labelled it first quarter blues. Um, but we've also got a couple of questions just about the um, five-day break, and I'm going to roll them all in, so just bear with us uh, a moment. Monocular says, once again, we came out and could not hit a disposal in the first quarter. This is becoming a habit. Is there an explanation? Very proud of the comeback, but just a bit too late. As always, incredibly thankful to you three for uh, your usually calm and reasoned analysis. Palace Dees agrees. The slow starts can be extended to the first halves. In the past four matches, we have kicked a total of 11 goals in the first halves and 29 in the second. One or two matches can be considered an anomaly, but four is a pattern. Can this be A, explained and or B, rectified? Smurf writes, slow start killed us, commendable fight back, but ultimately was our first quarter and inaccuracy that killed us. I would love to blame it on the five-day break, but we had some runs still in our legs at the death. Demonic Final Fantasy says, as everyone knows, we lost this game in the first quarter. How can we and why do we go missing panic and lose structure so easily? I suppose this re- this is rhetorical and born out of frustration from seeing us unexpectedly on the back foot from the get-go yet again. The recovery, whilst admirable, becomes almost irrelevant under the circumstances as that is what very good teams do, which we are almost. Uh, Travi 14, a little bit more optimistic when he says, uh, horrible, horrible first quarter, but to be an optimist after that, it is the best we have played in the wet for four years. Maybe Goody is learning. Uh, would have been great to win, to get uh, to get the win, uh, but it's not the end of the world. I do think we need Hunter in the rotation, and once Bowie is back to full fitness, there is a bit more class through the middle. Not too worried by this loss. And D Old Fart is also not too worried about the loss. He says, I love the pod, guys. Always an important part of my week. Not really a question, but a comment. Our start versus Carlton was obviously deplorable, not helped by the free kicks against, but I was very impressed by the ticker and belief we showed in working our way back into the game and then ultimately running it down to the wire. In my opinion, this never-say-die attitude combined with a full list can take us a long way in 2024. It probably sounds like heresy, but this was the first time in many years that I haven't felt totally gutted after a loss. Now, the old fart, that we've got to talk, mate. Um... Because I wish I could share that optimism, but I could never not feel gutted uh, by loss, no matter how admirable uh, uh, the circumstances, the slow start, um, and the arrogance of the team and the supporters that we played this week just made uh, the loss all the more gut wrenching uh, for me. Uh, we should we should never have been. I said it earlier. We've never been in that situation where we have to claw our way back into the cost spread contest. And perhaps uh, there are mitigating circumstances, which we'll talk about in a second uh, regarding our five-day breaks and even the adjudication, those umpires, pesky umpires. But nonetheless, it does nothing to take away that stinging feeling. Now, uh, I'm just going to go quickly to, I've got two on the five-day break. Lazy asks, 
As a fitness staff, how difficult is it to prepare a conditioning plan uh, for constant unorthodox breaks, e.g. five-day break followed by 10-day break? What, what, say, what adds? Do you believe both the MFC and Geelong were flat to start their games this week as a result of the intensity of their clash the previous round? Lazy, I think you're going to have to uh, find, ask that question to the people, I don't, the right, right people. I don't think uh, we're the right people to question on conditioning. Um, better suited for Selwyn Griffiths. Um, but let's go back to um, back to the first part, the first quarter, George. Can our heroic comeback, where we always almost snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, does, does that sugarcoat the horrific first quarter and 10 minutes in which we failed to score and found ourselves six goals in deficit? Uh, <clears throat> firstly, I'll, I'll preface this. I wasn't able to get to the game itself because of a COVID uh, <laughs> infection. Um, so I was watching it on TV, which created a, um, some interesting insights that you probably wouldn't get at the ground, but you do miss a lot uh, at, the, at the ground. Firstly, about the five-day break, I don't think people really yet appreciate how taxing this is on teams that are playing a five-day break. Um, we've seen a couple of examples. Bin Man before mentioned um, uh, the Giants. Um, Geelong uh, was another classic example, although they went off the five-day or off a six-day break on those old legs that they've got. They were five goals down in the first quarter and then seven goals down at half time. They couldn't do it. They couldn't lift their legs. Um, it was amazing that, how similar that game was in it terms was, of it, Absolutely, yeah. No, it was a tough, hard game that we had against Geelong and then we had to back up um, uh, five days later. Okay, I'll just oh, add, no, no. I want to add yeah, to one sec. Carlton also had a very tough game the week before on the Friday yeah. night, albeit they had six-day breaks, but they were also had the... Uh, th they had their third game in 13 days and fifth game in 26 days, which may account for why they died in the arts. Of yeah. yeah, but I reckon so, George. Just a, I reckon a real factor is, is the type of game Melbourne and Geelong played. So we, it was a really low stoppage, therefore high kilometre run, lots of running, repeat running, repeat sprints. We covered a lot of grounds, both teams. Um, and, you know, I, I thought maybe we would look to attack in this this game, but maybe that's why we reverted to a more physical contest game of the 21 to 23 because we didn't have our run in our legs. And when we got on top, it was when we could bring the physical contest. And Geelong, that game, I watched that game, George, it was almost identical. In fact, one of the commentators said exactly that. They don't look like they've got any run in their legs. And that was six or seven minutes into the first quarter. Um, so I think... You know, it, it goes to George's point about I don't think people sort of fully appreciate the impact of it. It's a, you know, it was a diff – Carlton-Collingwood game was a much different game to the Geelong-Melbourne game in terms of the uh, of the impact on the players. We ran them ragged and we ran each other ragged um, and they looked like they had more zip than us, the um, Blues. You know, most certainly they looked like they had more zip in that first 10 minutes. There's no question. The other um – the other example was on the weekend, Fremantle off a five-day break. Um, in that game, uh, in the last quarter, they'd kicked two goals, 13 and six out of bounds on the full. Yeah, they, and they, looked they a had, mile off they, an they, AFL team, didn't they? they? they I know they had, that the Cam McCarthy stuff was probably yeah, also yeah, a factor. They had, but, but kicking for goal requires that you're... Um, you know, fit and healthy and, and, and not fatigued. Yeah. If there was ever a team that looked fatigued, it was Fremantle again off a five-day break and even doubled up because they had to go from one side of the country to the other to um, to follow that up. So um, watching on the telly, there was one really telling point for me in the first quarter um, when the shot was down the ground and Melbourne were in attack um, and apart from our three main defenders who are sitting close to goal with their players, the next line of people in defence were our three mids, Viney, Petrarca and um, Oliver. They were trailing behind the play. They were completely shot. And unfortunately, their three opposing mids, um, Chera, uh, Cripps and Walsh, were already down the other end of the ground helping out with the defence. Um they were well out of it in that first quarter. They, they just couldn't keep up the pace. The other thing was um, uh, Carlton's mids, those three, are, are almost sprinters. They're, they're very fast over that first, you know, in the first 
10 metres or so. You can't say that any of our main three mids are sprinters by any stretch. They're tough inside, get the ball um, type of players. But you can't afford to give players like Chera and, and Walsh in particular um, a five-yard start. It wasn't surprising that they killed us in that first quarter with clearances out because as soon as as soon as they got the the ball, that was it. The delivery into the forward line was was made very easy because they it was unfettered um, possessions coming out in the middle. Um, <clears throat> so our guys were being left behind um, in the, in that uh, our mids were being left behind um, in that first quarter. It's not surprising to, to um, the result that came out. The other thing that was happening was um, uh, that. I picked up was Carlton actually play man on man defence. Um, they don't play a proper zone. Uh, so even though we had more inside fifties in the in that first quarter, every single time the ball went in there, um, it was someone's right on their shoulder. So I, I thought initially, why why are our players so far behind? Um, I thought they were playing bad wet weather football again. It wasn't that. It was the fact that they were just they never got a clean opportunity um, to mark. The other thing was that uh, those three mids, once again, were covering the holes in front. Um, so the Carlton defence was was being complemented by the um, uh, by their mids, and ours wasn't, unfortunately, uh, because our guys just couldn't, couldn't do the running. Just as equally, our guys are more, I've just talked about Carlton's uh, mids being more sprinters, ours are more long distance runners, and, and it was proven so in this game. Our guys just kept on, um, kept on keeping on for the whole game, and eventually it turned. Do you mean our mids? Our mids, yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah. spot on, yeah. spot on. Yeah. They're, they're power athletes, not yep. um, yeah. anaerobic athletes, and and yeah. I think that's yeah. a super important point. Yeah, and um, that will that will factor in more towards the end of the season. Um, Carlton's mids have a habit, uh, and it's been proven already this year, of dropping off. They they get a good lead in the game, which is what they plan for. They I listen to. Um, Crips after the game, they intended to come in fast for a start, and that's what they do. They've got to get the, they've got to get ahead of a team to be able to hold and then try to hold them off. They're not long distance um, performers, so uh, I, I think you'll see them drop off towards the end of the season because they just won't be able to sustain it, and it would be difficult for them in finals. The other thing that happened in the first quarter was it was a complete and utter stuff up. Um, Max Gorn was off the ground for nearly eight minutes. I don't know why. Um, um, he went off at just after the third, uh, third, 13 minutes to play and didn't come back on until 5 minutes 30 to play. Because I reckon he, like, he that was right. But he was smashed. He was totally smashed in a contest. Um, and that's if you, I don't know if you noticed how maybe you couldn't on the television, but you, you were at the game, weren't you, Andy? Max uh, was... Yes. As angry at the footy, at, and I've seen him, and he was furious because he was getting smashed off the ball. And I think he got hurt at one point, and I reckon it was at that point, George. Yeah. No, uh, no, what they were doing to him, Pittenet was doing that same blocking thing where they try to block him, you know, when there's a kick out or whatever, to block him so he can't get into position. They were doing it all night. But oh, uh, quite physically blocking him, not just. Yeah, him. running into him hard, and and he copped something, and I, I can't, I couldn't quite see it. I just saw that he was in some sort of, and I reckon it was at that point in time there was some huge hits. Um, he was he he was an angry ant for yeah. most of that match, as angry as I've seen him. I reckon. I've noticed he um he had a really strong go at Pittnet in that first quarter. Well, because um, Pittnet uh, just was right uh, into him, yeah, like, was yeah. him and everything. that mark, even the the mark, and or was it not mark or the free kick? Was it a free kick that Pittnet got? Or a mark that he kicked that, that was, goal. That was a free kick, yeah. right? It was an absolutely that. ridiculous free kick because of how much manhandling Max had been getting, and uh, he, I think, it was, no, it was because a, he threw him away. But it's no, just no, no, it was a, it was a free kick because it was punched out on the full. No, not not that one. The, the one that Pittenet right. kicked. All right. Yeah. Early oh, on, yeah. Pittenet had got a free kick. Uh, d- d- Max had got a free kick because of the manhandling in the ball ball in and he kept doing Pitnet kept doing it and then Max got frustrated I think and gave away the free. Anyway. So for the the upshot of it all was that Max was off the ground in that first quarter um for 8 minutes that was 8 minutes plus time on. That's 8 minutes out of the 20 that it, that um is played just on the numbers on the screen. Um the, re- the other result was that JVR played the whole of the first quarter. 
didn't get a break at all in the first quarter. Um, so Max off the ground, um, JBR trying to hold it up, um, playing both full forward and and Ruck. Um, um, it's it's not surprising that the Carlton mids got on top in the first quarter. What was really interesting for me was um, the res- the change that um, uh, Goody made at quarter at quarter time. Um, a couple of things. Firstly, putting Petrarca down in the forward line because he he probably couldn't run as hard as he needed to to try and keep up with with the other with the other mids. If they're playing man on man, well, Petrarca man on man one will always win. And it proved during the game, you know, kicking five goals while he was up there. He's he's unbeatable if he's only playing, uh, got one person to beat. Um, putting A and B uh, into the middle and Cozzy and Sparrow, all of those guys are much better runners than what we had. Yeah, got, than what point. we had, and that that limited the effects of um, of the three Carlton mids. Um, stopped them. Uh, stopped their. Um, uh, it didn't stop them completely because you can't stop them, but it stopped the free wheeling um, that they experienced in that certainly in that first ten minutes or fifteen minutes in the first quarter. So we made the changes, but when you're six goals down, it takes a long time to come back. We did, and it was and it was fantastic what what we did um, to to um, to achieve what we what we did in the end, but only going down by um, a point. But um, yeah, we were we were. Um, Stuffed by the five, the five, the five day break, we were hit by Carlton, who were by any measure a good team. You know, the, um, and they, they planned, took every chance. <laughs> they took every chance, and they, and they planned to as well. Yeah. They planned to hit us real hard in the first ten minutes with their speed. Um, we couldn't run with them. We made the changes and ground them down in the end. So um, it'll be interesting come finals time. I think we'll see a see a completely different result. I mean, I think that's a really good point. And I was, in terms of thinking uh, through last week, you know, that we might go fast, I think I got that wrong. I think that the sort of, there's every chance, regardless of the weather, that we came into this game with the plan to revert back to our 21 to 23 model of forward half contest footy because we figured that's where we'd be able to um, sort of, you know, mitigate the impact of that five-day break and in particular how aerobically um, challenging the, the Cats game was. And as we saw, the, that's exactly what the Cats did. The Cats didn't run their way back into the game. The Cats physically tried to overpower them and got themselves back in the game, which is exactly um, what we did. It was really interesting that Voss was – he noted, he said in his presser that they – you know, one of his answers to a question was that they were really focused on a fast start and he, this is his words, to try and exploit the five-day break factor. And, and as you say, George, I think that, you know, the, the footy world's just got to come to terms with this and start, you know, working out how to properly analyse it because, you know, the uh, that running factor is a really good point. The talk about, you know, putting track forward was viewed as a tactical, you know, genius move. But in all likelihood, the main driver of it was is that he probably couldn't get up and down the ground properly because he is the classic power athlete. He's not an anaerobic beast like um, Nibbler who can back up from running 15 kilometres and five days later run 15 kilometres. Track, you know, would have been probably pretty useless as a mid in terms of his ability to repeat repeat stri- uh, sprints or to do long 100 metre runs that he normally does. So what do you do with a power athlete? You put him up forward. Um, you know, it's what it's been happened since time immemorial of footy. You put, you know, when Lee Matthews can't run anymore in the midfield, he got chucked up forward and, um, you know, the tracks game was was sensational. But, yeah, totally right. They were really focused on um, exploiting that. And I think probably if I... Uh, something that I would have loved to have seen them do, which normally Melbourne do do well, and maybe this is credit to the Blues for not allowing us to do this and taking advantage of the momentum, is but we never held the ball and chipped it around and, and took some of the heat out of the game. It um, it felt really ballistic um, for that first 10 minutes, which probably, or well, actually for the first 20 minutes, which probably played into to the Blues' um, hand. And, um, you know, again... You know, the, uh, they got some very clean looks and took their chances in normal circumstances, particularly when it's wet and raining, you know, which doesn't even come into ex- expected score, by the way. The weather doesn't come into it. So, you know, that for them to score five straight in that first quarter and then then score that first goal in the second quarter, which was a heartbreaker, um, that, you know, that 
that, that was sort of statistically pretty unlikely scenario. So, uh, you know, it definitely was, a, um, you know, as we talked about at the top, as Goody said, is that's when we lost it. Um, you know, but to be honest, there was a lot of unlucky bounces of the ball and we couldn't quite clunk some marks and, you know, everything seemed to be rolling for them. Um, um, but, you know, they, they were definitely the better side in the first quarter. They, they had a uh, quarter, they had a plan, they executed it really well. Uh, and, you know, I've talked about the 30-point um, margin a million times on the podcast. Very few teams lose once you get to a 30-point lead at any point in the match. Very team, a few teams lose from that point. Except us. Still, uh, that 48. When, when did we lose with a 30 <laughs> point? That 48 point lead at three quarter time against Dessert a long way. Well, right. Yeah, geez, you really. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when was that? That was 98. <laughs> I was at that game on the top uh, well, of the Ponsford when it was a concrete mausoleum. Well, there's positives you know, out of Salmon of, went nuts, didn't he? Yeah, my, my uh, you know, when we were four, 40 seconds to go and we needed a goal, I thought. Well, we kick three goals in a minute in the grand final. Two goals we can get. Uh, well, I, I can be blamed for that loss because I yelled out percentage halfway through the third quarter <laughs> in the in the bombers' loss. In the bombers' loss uh, yeah. back in the day. Um, let's get move on. Uh, and this one's for you, B man. Uh, uh, Radish D uh, says, "Hi, gents. Love the pod." I didn't get to watch almost any of the game, but it seemed to me that the five-day break was an issue for us, hence the slow start. Once both sides tired out, we seemed to have the run of the game. Is that what it looked like live? Not too unhappy with the result. A win would have been better for sure, but I have to think that in another game and in a final with full breaks, we would be fitter and better team. The first quarter was bad, but I think it has to be considered an outlier rather than an indication of where either team is at. Do the panel agree? I'm sure B-Man does. Um, I think B-Man's notion that each game is not a litmus test on flag credentials is especially important now. We've looked good in many games and looked bad in small stages. I think our best footy is right up there with probably the best two or three sides in the comp. The challenge for the Ds is delivering that consistently in September. The change to the red and blue print means that sometimes it might not, not quite all come together which is not a problem in the month of May. We're growing and improving and Goody always says that the team wins that that the team wins the flag is not the best team, uh, but the team that improves the most. I think we have that in us, go Ds. And that's a new name that I haven't seen on Demonland before. Welcome to Demonland, uh, Radish D. Thank you for listening. Uh Binman, you've made that this point about the notion of each game not being a litmus test on flag credentials. So can you give a thorough explanation uh, of what that means, especially to people like me, uh, perhaps who see the game in black and white, wins and losses. I get that we're in May and there's a lot of water uh, to flow under the bridge between now and September and the home and away season is all the preparation for that. The slow start this week cost us four points, very valuable four points against a team that we're competing against for a top four position. We do the same thing against Nesson or GWS at Collingwood two times. We've got to play them Fremantle two times more Brisbane and against Port on the return fixture. Maybe your top four finish and the double chance goes begging. So you don't want to fail too many litmus tests on the run to the finals. Well, none of them are litmus tests. I mean, so the short version of my, you know, my comment about that is that we've been conditioned for a long time by the media and, and by the coverage of the game are you sorry, talking about us as supporters? Yeah, sorry, us as a collective, as footy fans, to view each week, each game as a game on an island that has, you know, it's each game is for sheep stations. Um, you know, they, they pump it up, the media pump it up. It's been going on for 70s, in the 70s and 80s when I, you know, it felt like that. There were seven days. It was, you know, each time was a gladiatorial contest. The, the coverage of the game hasn't changed and Channel 7 and Fox don't want any talk about five-day breaks. They don't want to talk about um, this game is actually not that significant in the scheme of things. They want each game to have some sort of incredible significance and the way that they talk about it and the sort of reflexive discussion that happens every Monday is, well, you know, what does that mean for a team's chances of winning the flag? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the Giants were lauded. You go on Demon Land and everyone was saying they were the benchmark. I put a post up saying that we're the best, got the best list in the AFL. And someone, 
laughed at it said oh what about the giants and so i went through it and said well i still reckon i went through the best 10 and the best um the next uh, 10 and uh made my case that was the best but no 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 the, the giants are the best team going well what's happened to them now are we riding the giants off because of the loss on the weekend what's that two in a row isn't it um are we riding um the cats off who have now lost two in a row some might um, are we riding Port off, who just beat the Cats because um, the Adelaide Crows um, beat them? Um, each week is not a litmus test or some sort of measure of a team's chances of winning a flag. Of course, the four points is super important. The, the purpose of the home and away season for a team that's in contention to win a flag is to finish top four. That's it. Nothing else. And so each game is with a view to that future. And if you listen to, there's a real theme, you can hear it. Um, if you go to Channel 7's app and go back to the win over the um, Cats, listen to the interview with uh, Clary. I really love when Clary's interviewed because he doesn't sort of play into the media spin and, and he's really straightforward and really honest. And he just basically said that we've um, hit the gr- uh, last two finals, banged up and not in the best place and you know we've gone out straight set so we're looking at it differently this year and uh, we want to be playing our best footy not just our freshest and being physically ready we want to be playing our best footy on the eve of the finals Um, it's that sort of idea that I've been talking about over the last few seasons that it's about winning the war not winning the individual battles of course we would have loved the four points we almost did you could tell how frustrated Goody was we had a clear plan I have no doubt we had a plan um, to uh, win the port then into the Adelaide game you know the business plan they call a business trip they were talking about so that was a key focus Focus. I, I have no doubt that they had the same focus in this game. Goody was furious that we didn't win. But in the scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean anything. You know, of course, you could say, well, what happens if we miss top four by the four points that at this game? But who knows what happens between now and then? We've got another four months of football before we get to the finals. Um, it, it, it's a media narrative. They want to play the game that each game is a um, some sort of measure. Um, but there's only one team left that's the Swans that you could argue that. All of the other teams, all of the so-called contenders, have lost games that if you apply the litmus test to each of those games and said, well, if they this will give them some sort of audit about their chances of winning the flag, well, every other team other than the Swans has failed that test. Every team. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm not so much of the opinion that uh, we're not because we lost this game, we're not good enough to win it. I'm seeing it really in black and white that we didn't get the four points yeah. and those four points are important. We play, we, it's an eight point game to Carlton. We win that and they're two games behind us. They're going to be up there competing with us. For top four. That, that might stop. be true. Two games out from the finals. Of course, as soon as you get the closer, you get to the finals, the more that comes into focus, but we've got what another 15 games for the home and away scenes. A million things can happen. Two weeks ago, Geelong were unbeaten. They've now lost two in a row, yeah, and are yeah. they what? Where are they on the ladder now? I was never rating them. I, yeah, I but it doesn't matter. Well, but just what you, you were never rating them, but all of the media was. They were oh. flag favourites, and so and so it really, in the scheme of things, of course, it might come back to bite us. And we had the same conversation the last two years. In the last two years. We had exactly the same conversation, Andy. And the last two years, we finished top four, regardless of your concerns about eight-point games and we're not going to make it and oh, what about if my, if, with my auntie had a beard or, you know, remember, it's like remember my, it's so much to go. And it, going back to George's point, it's the what I've you know, been talking about is the complete and utter blinkers the footy media and the, the footy world has got on about the importance of the high-performance team and the program that they're trying to put in place. So if each game was a litmus test, then all you'd worry about is putting, you wouldn't worry about the next game the week after or the one after that. You just throw all your eggs in the one basket and try to win that game. Everything, plan around winning that game. Well, what happens if we then go to West Coast um, and get beaten by the Eagles because we've thrown all of our you know, energy to beat the Blues? Uh, Does that then suddenly mean, oh, hold on, we beat the Cats, we beat the Blues, we're definitely a contender, we're past the litmus test, oh, no, we've been beaten by the Eagles, good team wouldn't be beaten by the Eagles. A reminder, 
the Swans, who now was, you know, two weeks ago it was the Giants. Everyone was like, oh, I can't believe how deep the list of the Giants are. They're going to go, you know, they're definitely flag favourites. They're the best team in it. So good off the halfback flank, yada, yada, yada. Now it's the Swans. The Swans got beaten by Richmond, who just got flogged by 90 points on the weekend by the Dogs. So did they fail a litmus test when they got beaten by Richmond? Like a good team doesn't get beaten by a team who then gets flogged by 90 points a few weeks later. So, I mean, do you know what I mean? It just gets, it just gets absurd. So we've got so much to go in this season. So, of course, it was disappointing to lose. Of course, it would have been great to get the four points. I think we would have won if we didn't give up five goals in that first quarter. Exactly like Woody said, that's where we lost it. I have no doubt they set themselves to win the game. But it really, in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter. And if you are thinking it's a litmus test, well, do you rate Carlton? Do you think Carlton are a good team? I think they've got um, some very good uh, pieces. I don't. Think so do you think they're a contender? Team, but I, I, yeah, I do. I think. Okay, they're, they're a contender. They beat us by one point, Andy. One not, point. It's not like they flogged us by forty points. That we started the game slow in a game we yeah, should have but, uh, five goals. But uh, we're talking about whether it's a litmus test, right? If it's a litmus test, they only beat us by a point. One of those de- poor decisions by the umpires in that game could have changed. One miss by um, the Blues. I was sitting right behind a couple of those shots in that first quarter. And, and what's his name? I think it was um, uh, Kerno. For sure that was going to hit the post. At the last second it deviated to miss the post. It doesn't deviate we win the game or it's a draw, right? So, you know... We, if you rate the Blues, we almost beat them. So, you know, the scoreboard, if we just go on the litmus test, we're one point, they're a one point better team than us. All right. Well, if they're a contender, we're a contender. I think you're trying to put David King out of a job here, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine we do lose to West Coast? And it's a, it's a possibility. Uh, well, well, that, that we might be winning a flag then because each yeah, week I, is a litmus test. Now, if we will not win a flag if we lose to the Eagles. <laughs> now, do you remember 2021, my famous um, uh, ladder predictors? They had a doomsday scenario that we didn't even make the finals. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> and we've, you know, we've barely been out of the top four for, you know, no, I, like, you if you want a litmus test. You're not a good team. I'm look saying. Look at the ladder. Look at the ladder. We're 6 3. Is it 6 3? Is it 6 3? Yeah. 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 6 3 and fourth on the ladder. Fourth, we're top four, like, is our, our home. We don't, you know, we have to get evicted to get out of the top four. We've lived in the top four since the beginning of 21. I mean, so if you want to, you know, if you want a litmus test, look at the ladder. We've got a ladder. We've got a way of measuring where teams are. It's called a, a ladder. And oh, we're currently fourth, which says after the, after what, round nine, we are the fourth best team in the competition. That's the litmus test. After after that game on Thursday night, if you would have told me we were still going to be uh, fourth after the round, I would have said. Well, after the first quarter. <laughs> yeah, after the first quarter, even after we lost the game. All right. Let's move on because we're going in circles. Uh, uh, midfield and the five-day break, um, it talks about some kilometres, so uh, I hope you've got some stats with you, Bin Man. Um, La- uh, Lakeside Oval, that's a, a poster on Demonland. Uh, absolutely love the show, guys. I would like to discuss uh, midfield performance uh, post-five-day breaks. We have in the past heard how the midfield and high half forwards can cover huge kilometres in a game. We have tracking technology and individual player hot map data on ground coverage. My question is, is it known whether the midfield and high half forward collective distance covered is less or as expected post a five-day break? The MFC game plan relies on two-way running and my sense from the Blues game is that the runners look slower. Could Biman stats guru assist here? Should we have ha- should we have more players go through the middle each side of the five day break? So that's another new poster in the podcast thread. Thanks for listening, Lakeside. Uh, B man, do you have any numbers uh, in the stats in regards to the distance covered by the mids, the half forwards, and I'll, I guess I'll add the wings to that group uh, that show any differential between a five day break and say a more regular seven day or a ten day t- ten day break that we've had. Just, any of those stats of, of- just taking that last question is um, about running different players through uh, the oh, yeah, middle, yeah. which is exactly what George said we did. 
So we had even Langdon, I think, took a um, centre square or was at stoppages. But we had no, – that's exactly what we did. And as George noted, we put our best runners into the middle, um, which is no coincidence. So it wasn't like, you know, it probably would have been a planned process. So as for the data, is so it's a really good question. And I, you might remember last year, Andy, I called up and we played it on the show. I called up um, SEN and left a – or texted actually and asked the question of Daniel Hoyne for um, that full-on footy analysis he does on on Tuesday specifically about that can we get some data around the not on the five-day break but can we get some data that would shine a light on relative fitness um, between the two teams and for me the sort of data that would you know is a good start to that is the kilometers run the sprinting kilometers the sort of striding um, uh, kilometers that they talk about um, that sort of data and the answer they read the question out on the show and we played it on here the answer was that no champion data do not have access to that um, the GPS data only um, the clubs have a- access to so the shorter answer is n- yeah, don't, we don't, see that? Or- don't we see them don't we see that data sometimes they show us the 15 we do so the if you go to the AFL app um, yeah, or the I mean, AFL uh, on, the on the web on the PC is that they have the tracking data but they just show the record so they kept oh, all the records right. and they just show the top five in oh, these categories distance covered um, at total speed and high speed um, speed which is maximum speed um, and average uh, sprinting um, and sprinting is so maximum speed is reached by an individual player. Average speed is average speed across the whole game. Total sprints is total times a player has run above 24 kilometres for at least one second. Repeat sprints is amount of total sprints above 24 kilometres within 60 seconds of each other. Average speed in attack, and this is an interesting one. This is, goes to the question. Average speed of an individual player while the uh, their team has the ball, has the possession of the ball. Average speed in defence is average speed of an individual player while the opposition has possession. Um, and total distance covered is, is uh, you know, it speaks for itself. Distance at high speed, distance covered by an individual player above 18 kilometres an hour indicates the amount of high speed running. Um, maximum speed, uh, I mentioned before, those figures tell directly that answer that directly that question and are direct, um, uh, a direct sort of indicator of fitness uh, and their ability to cover the ground. The players have access to all of their own data. So for this data, they know exactly what data distances they cover in all of those categories in every match they play and every training session, right? That's how significant that data is. So the answer to the question is no, I don't. But uh, there was an interesting back uh, dialogue with Watson11, who's been tracking some of this data himself by collecting it from the from the app. Um, and so as for the five-day break, there isn't any data that I can sort of look to. Champion data can't get access to it. AFL have got this data locked up because the clubs don't want to share it because it's critical IP for the clubs. So the oh, clubs yeah. will not, apart from the, the top five, right? So, but what I can tell you is that I've been looking at this. I've been looking at it for a long time in terms of um, just Melbourne on the on the tracker data. So we're almost always literally the top four, top five, usually the top three minimum in each of the categories that I just mentioned, almost always. And it's always those players that were mentioned. So the wingers, high half forwards in particular, they're the ones who cover the most um, distance and they're the ones who dominate. They always dominate um, for us, particularly um, um, average speed in um, defence when they've got the ball. So that's how it looks most week. We dominate these numbers. This week off a five-day break, um, in terms of total distance covered, uh, Langdon 15.4. He ran 15.9 last week against the Cats. It may not sound a big difference but you know every meter makes a big difference in you know particularly with a five-day break then Tommy McDonald was second like Nibbler's normally second um and then Billings and our higher forwards Tommy McDonald was 15.2 then the next three players were Blues players uh, for the total distance high speed was even more anomalous for us I'm saying anomalous <laughs> but uh Langdon again uh, he was the uh, three he ran three point one kilometers at high speed, but then it was Hollands, Cottrell, and Acres for the Blues, which goes to George's points. And Caleb Windsor way down there in fifth. Um, speed maximum speed was King Cotter, then Pickett, Langdon, Chandler, Neil Bull, and so that was better for us. But the average speed was Hollands, um, and normally it's always Nibbler, uh, Neil Bull, and Sparrow, Walsh, and Langdon um, for sprinting. 
Langdon was number one for total number of spins, 23, then Pickett. Then the next three were Blues players, and that's, that one's almost always us. Repeat sprint was even more dramatic. So we had one player who had four repeat sprints, which was Cozzy. Uh, and then the next four players on the list of repeat sprints were all Blues. Hollands, Cottrell, Kemp, and Kerno. Work rate, this one's the, the, the one that they like to use as an evidence of work rate and ability to sort of really work hard. Average speed in attack. Normally, we dominate this number was Walsh, which goes to George's point about Walsh's athletic ability and his running ability. He um, His average speed in attack was 9.1 kilometres. Number two was Holland. And then for us, it was Howes, Bowie, Turner. Like normally it's Nibbler or sometimes, um, you know, we're, it's hardly ever housed for, although he's relatively quick, um, and turn one of our thing. But this is the one that's really jumped out. With last week, for instance, this is average speed in defence. The top five players against Geelong for average speed in um, defence were all Melbourne players. In this game, the number one for average speed in defence was Woey. Then it was Hollands for them, Neil Bullen for us, Chera and Holland. So for three of the top five uh, average speed and defence were Blues in this game. Um, and then total distance, uh, they ran three more kilometres than us over the entire game, 293 to 290. Um, and we were dead even on, um, on speed. So then sprinting was much the same. Uh, and But in the sprints, in the repeat sprints, they had 26 repeat sprints. We only had 21. And I don't recall us losing that particular stat before. So it's sort of a, a long way of saying is that, yes, I think it sort of it makes sense that it would a five-day impact would have a significant impact on our runners, on the, on the players who are there for running because, you know, on that list we were missing a, a ton of our big runners and the one that was been on the list all season in most of those categories that was nowhere to be seen except for one category in this game was Windsor. Um, you know, which makes sense. A young player, we're asking him to back up five days with, you know, no break. He hasn't been subbed off and he wasn't able to provide anywhere near the run, nothing close to the run. Like I said, he's normally on each of those categories I just read out. He's normally in, he has been in them, particularly the sprint ones, uh, and he was nowhere to be seen. So, you know, you can see just from those numbers that they were running better than us. Um, if there was some way to measure physical strength in the contest, I think then we matched them and one of them is contested possessions and we smashed them in contested possessions and tackles. Well, not smashed them in contested possessions, but definitely in tackles. Because um, we'll probably forget about it a bit later. Uh, just on uh, Windsor, um, would you th- consider giving him a rest this week? Well, I, I mean, it's sort of, we have, again, it's sort of the conversation we have all the time. It, it's really interesting. It goes to the high performance. Partly it's my frustration is, I don't know, like yeah. I've got no idea because I've the the media's job is to educate footy fans and all I'm doing is trying to piece together the information I can, you know, like a magpie find on the internet and bits and pieces here. I mean, it would be great if the media interviewed a high performance manager. How many high performance managers yeah, at I mean, other clubs other than the Selwyn Griffith can you name? Other than Burgess at the Crows, they're, they're, I would argue that they're equally important as the coach in terms of a team's premiership ch- um, chances, and we don't even talk about them. And so Geelong's a really interesting example. They do the opposite to us; they rest players, but Burgess never did. Um, and we've seen the value of playing um, Clary half, you know, injured um, since the beginning of the season, and same with Paddy playing him into form. And that's the way. Um, uh, Burgess approached it was to keep playing through and resilience and it feels like that Selwyn Griffith has got a same strategy so would you rest him? I don't know. I'm not a high performance sort of specialist. I don't think they will if that's the question because um, I mean, they haven't done. There's no history of them doing. They did flag that they'll give him a rest at some stage but so maybe they will this week. Um, maybe he needs it based on those numbers. Get into the uh, umpiring. Uh, Bigfoot says umpires absolutely murdered us in the first half, eleven to three. Freeze evened up throughout the rest of the match, but there were some horrible non-decisions that killed us. So, don't get me started on this. Uh, uh, I've, you know, I view demons' games through uh, red and blue lenses, uh, as we all do. So, I invariably think they were always hard done by uh, the Blues fans around me. They didn't think that the eleven three count was fair at all and I even heard some complaints that they they had been killed by the umpires all season but I didn't have the heart to to inform them that going into this match they had a differential of plus 32 uh free kicks so the half time differential of 
plus eight, took them to plus 40. Uh, conversely, prior to this match, we had achieved parity in terms of freeze for and against this season. Uh, we now sit uh, minus two after this game, though. Uh, but it's the free kicks that you don't get, uh, including when players stage and dive to the ground to force a dangerous tackle uh, or, or, or force the push in the back. And that was a double whammy for us, probably a triple whammy, because ultimately it cost us an important goal. Uh, there was quite a few. George, uh, I, I know you wanted me to rant about this. Anything you want to add? Um, you did a good job of ranting. Um, the decision that really stood out, out for me, it's not so much about whether it was holding the ball or you know should have been a throw, should have been this. The really telling one for me that absolutely cost us was when Pitternet was um, punched the ball out. Um, off from the ruck t- contest. Um, Maxi couldn't believe it. Max couldn't That's believe not, it. Is that, that a free that, if it comes off? Yeah, or is you, that can, a, yeah you can't punch the ball over on the full from a ruck contest. But it didn't so, come off Max. It I mean, didn't come off Max. Well, uh, Maxi hit it into Pitney, Pitney, didn't he? No, no, no. That's the advantage of the, the te- watching on the television. It was Pitney's fist in front. That's why Max right. was, was so furious. Pitnet gets a free and kicks the goal. Um, that's there's the match there. What really annoyed me was that Williamson, the umpire, was standing right in front of it. You really couldn't tell in in you know just looking at it who had actually hit it. But he made a decision. The decision he should have made was, I didn't see that. I can't tell. Throw it in again. Yeah, of course. And I mean, that's the obvious but, thing. Yeah, yeah. and but he yeah. looked. They looked confused. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, but, yeah. What, exactly. What? When in doubt, why not throw it in? Yep. Or go what? to the vi- – I mean, they can't go to the vision. There isn't the rule. That's a stupid no, no. thing about having that. If there's doubt about it, don't call anything. Just you know, throw it in again. Thanks very much. Off we go. That that was the game. That scored the goal. They got yeah. the goal out of that that, that won them the game. Um, we, we always get frustrated uh, with the um, – uh, what do you call it? Uh, deliberate out of bounds. Yeah, there was it's not one, deliberate. <laughs> it's <laughs> insufficient terrible, attempt. To get. Yeah, insufficient attempt, whatever they call it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one that got me uh, on the on Thursday night was Viney was tackled as he's kicked it. He was tackled and then kicked it, and then it went out, and they call that insufficient intent. Uh, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> I mean, really, it just drives me nuts. Like, I'm not it, – If we're going to have – it wasn't a factor in the result, so I'm not going to blame no, the no, umpiring. Things like, that. but the idea that their mistakes don't influence the game is is just wrong. I mean, so I'm not blaming the umpires. I'm blaming the AFL for the ridiculous. You know, there's so many. You know, forget the conversation that we've had the last few years of my view that there should be professional umpires. Forget that the AFL. You know, I cannot. I, I've said this before. Is that I just can I've come to the conclusion the AFL deliberately keep opaque rules in the game because they get some benefit from the controversy that every week um, happens every week and the obvious you know there's so many sort of low hanging fruit rule changes they could make that would make the job of the umpire easier mm. so the um, the obvious one is the out of bounds one. Just, I mean, we've been trialing it in the AFLW. Just bring it in in the the AFL. Just bring it in because it, like footy fans, what really drives footy fans nuts is the inconsistency in it. So there's that one, and then there's the other one is sort out the holding the ball rule, or you know, just sort it out. There was a free kick where we got pinged for holding the ball. It seems like we're the only team in the AFL at the moment getting pinged for holding the ball. When and and just minutes before, um, Walsh gets tackled multiple times, and you know I, I thought the rule was if you put your arm out to fend off and then get tackled and don't dispose, that's automatically free kick. Well, he did it twice, um, and it was at a critical time. And then there were others like there was I don't know I haven't looked at the replay yet. I'm, I plan to because uh, I want to watch you know, well that particularly the second half. But there's 
the I was up in the Shane Warne stand right behind the goals on that sort of second level, so I had a great view of that last 30 seconds of the game. His track was just getting completely dragged off the ball, like completely manhandled. And it, he threw a player to the ground and the Blues fans went nuts. Like, But that was because I was watching him. They were grappling him. Um, they, and They'd you know, actually thrown him to the ground 30 seconds before. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And... Like you've said, George, before, and you too, Andy, it's not the free kicks necessarily that get paid. It's the ones that don't get paid. The umpire's job is to make decisions. If they see a free kick, like there was, that was such a clear free kick. He was being held before the ball was bounced. That's a free kick, full stop. Doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter that there's 30 seconds to go. And the implications of that is giving an opportunity for the a team to win the game. Your job is to make a decision if a free kick is there. Just the final one on that is that the AFL, again, for a millionth time, have created a rod for their own back. And they, they're they going to end up getting sued out of oblivion if they don't sort this. That um, What was it, Camp? That was right below me. That tackle was just the perfect tackle from Van Ruin, the absolute perfect tackle. And, of course, when it looked like it was... Um, a um, uh, it was play on an advantage and we got the goal. I was going ballistic or whatever, couldn't work it out. Is Kemp absolutely put his head towards the ground? And so leaving that aside, I'm not blaming the umpires. There was a bunch more that, you know, were dubious, I thought, um, and ones we weren't paid, particularly in that first quarter. But really, if the AFL series about head injuries... A player's going to have their neck broken because they're searching for a free kick. He should be fined for that. He should be he should be suspended because he's putting his own, you know, health and safety at risk by putting his head down. And he's you and see he, five, he, six, he, seven he, times a round of footy, you see players doing exactly that, searching for the ground with their head, and someone is going to get their neck broken because of that action. Can you prove that? That he was intentionally can say it was in the tackle. I couldn't do anything. Well, really, well, can I prove it? Doesn't really matter because it didn't wasn't even a um, dangerous tackle. It was a perfect tackle. So yeah, yeah, the no, point I whether he's, about whether you can prosecute that. Well, they've it's got to stamp it out. They've got to find a way to not do it because that this is the what I, we were talking about last year is the AFL keep on making these bone fisted decisions about rule changes with no thought of the unintended consequences of of those decisions. And this is a classic unintended consequence of bringing in this sort of rule about sling tackles or dangerous tackles or the dangerous tackles was always there without giving consideration to are we going to create an environment where players are actually putting themselves at risk. And that's exactly what happened. And and as I said, you see it more than five, six times. You see it seven, eight, ten times around where players are searching for the ground in the tackle. And the other one that is, happens all the time is player going limp when they're getting tackled and allowing themselves to get slung. It happens, you know, at least four or five. Someone's going to get hurt and it's on the AFL. Let's move on. Um, I think you might have touched on this. So just be man, you tell me if you need to go into any more detail or read them out. Uh, B Man's PA, friend of yours, B Man. Uh, were were our centre stoppages setups too aggressive in the first quarter? Even when they started putting scores on us, we never really reverted to a defensive setup and continued to go for the clean breakaway clear, clearance. Demonstrative asks: Has the coaching moved too far away from stoppage slash contested football? Is this the reason why Track Viney and Clary, although Clary had an injury and poor pre and poor preseason, are out of form? Our strong midfield has been consistently beaten too easily for the first time uh, in years. I'm interested in Big Man's thoughts on how we can compete better in the contest and keep slingshot footy. Uh, the midfield performed better with Sparrow and a and at centre square throw-ups. At the break of Gorn, seconds this and asks, can you guys please have a robust discussion regarding our midfield? I don't want to hear pressure and tackling stats. I want to focus on pure ball in hand stuff because we've been poor all year except for one or two games. Big Man, your, your forte. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm getting a bit fired up tonight, so uh, I've been throwing another one. But the, just the, um, Bim Man's PA's question about were we too aggressive, it's an interesting one because if you look at it, it was amazing to watch this. Both teams had free players all over the and, – and the same thing was in the Cats game. So it sort of goes to my point a little bit that I said earlier about these games are often used for trialling things for, for later on. So, you know, going to the point about that litmus test, you don't trial things in a must-win game. 
But we were clearly trying, so was Voss, they were clearly trying setups, um, you know, in terms of different setups in the middle. Um, you know, uh, were we too aggressive? Um, well, they scored five goals, you could say. It's a bit tricky, though, because who's too aggressive? They would have come in with a plan. Um, it's really difficult to get runners out there. Uh, you know, two or three of those goals were pretty quick. The players have to follow the plan, um, you know, that they set out before the game. Of course, you could get a runner out to go to, say, plan B or what it might look like, but really you've only got to quarter time to reset up your structures, which they they seem to do. Um, it's worth noting too that we scored two goals ourselves from clean stoppages. So it looked like we were trying to um, engineer clean stoppages ourselves, as, as the question suggested. Was it too aggressive? Well, scoreboard would suggest that you know, it was a factor in us losing, so perhaps it was for sure. As for the midfield, I, I, I found it really curious on Demon Land, the, the criticism of the midfield uh, in this game. And it depends what you know what you're talking about are you talking about the midfield as individually as individual players um or are we talking about the midfield as a group um you know for a start the game is moving away from clearances it was last year it is just no longer a um of course you could point to this game and say well they scored five goals from the middle but as i noted before it was only what plus down five from stoppages so you can't have you know it's not all center clearances they're only normally you know teams don't score hardly at all from the and clearances. This was an incredibly and not you know strange match for seven goals to be scored from out of the centre. But it goes to what um, Bimman's PA is saying about how aggressive the setups were. That was a function. Seven goals from the centre was a function of both teams setting up really aggressively and rolling the dice. We rolled the dice and and we lost on that. You know, it's about the midfield as a group. So it depends what you're looking at. Um, but stoppages and clearances and are just simply not um, a, a a number a key indicator that, um, of the same value it was five, six, seven years ago. The game has moved to a turnover game. Sixty to seventy percent of scoring is from turnovers. So the stats that relate to turnover, scores from turnover, stopping the opposition, scores from turnover, where those turnovers happen are much more significant to football clubs now than clearances. As an example of, of that, so in the clear, in the AFL at the moment, clearance is the best clearance team in the AFL from centre clearance is, is the Blues, then Collingwood, then Port. The team that's on top of the ladder, so where, what are we, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we're, we're down in 14th. The team that's on top of the ladder everyone's raving about is um, Sydney. They're behind us. They're one, they're, so they're 15th um, in the AFL for centre clearances. For stoppage clearances, um, much the same. They're just above us in, um, in 10th spot, uh, 11th spot. So we're in 12th. So, you know, the best team in the AFL at the moment only losing one game is below mid-table and basically the same as us for both centre clearances and stoppage clearances. Um, you know, up the top there, you've got Collingwood who are outside the eight, Port who were not in the top four, Gold Coast are fourth, Essendon, North Melbourne uh, uh uh, six for centre clearances. Um, it just really isn't a, a stat that's, um, you know, as significant as it was. Of course, it's important. Of course, you could point to the fact that um, Blues scored five goals from centre clearances. But as I just said, they're the best centre clearance team in the AFL and they only scored five more points from stoppages than us. So, you know, big tick. They, the, you know, the big tick for the midfield in this game. The top rated, so again, for the, taking this particular match, I'm not sure why the mids copped it. The top-rated player from either team was Track. Yes, he played forward too, but he still played through the middle and had crazy, I can't remember what his metres gained were, but I saw at one point it was 570 and that was in the third quarter. So um, a huge performance by him. Our next highest-rated player, so the rating is a really useful way because it measures impact. Disposal numbers are no longer really a useful indicator of anything particularly. They don't tell us anything they just tell how many kicks someone's got they don't tell us what they did with it so the um the player rating looks at every single intervention a player has in the game and, and scores it out of six to arrive at uh the score so our next highest and third behind crips was jack viney nibbler um was fourth overall from both teams and fourth for us uh who played through the middle Clary was fantastic in the first half, absolutely fantastic, but he faded a little bit, but was still our eighth highest rated player. It depends whether you count um, Max in, in the midfield. Um, Max was only our sixth best player, so he was down on the night, and yet um, our mids did well. 
the blue, as I said, the Blues are the best clearance team in the AFL. They only had two more clearances in total than us. So you know, if you look at that as a group, um, you know that's a, a it's a very strong performance by that midfield group. Now, if you're looking at the players individually, you know. I mean, one thing we have to remember, we lost Gus, he, our, one of our starting midfielders before on the eve of the season. So we're not being able to replace him. Viney's been quieter for the last three, four weeks, but was but almost our best player and was brilliant in the first four games. Oliver's numbers are amazingly good considering his limited preseason and that he played with a broken hand for at least three games, a sore rib for one of those games and the last two games post-surgery um, recovering from that. Two minutes into the second, Oliver had the most disposals for us with 12. He had three disposals in the first two minutes of the second quarter. He was our best player, I think, in the first half. As I said, you know, Petrarca, um, you know, obviously played forward a bit, but was still powerful um, as a uh, as a mid. So, yeah, I, I just don't see. I, I mean, of course, you know, with losing Gus, um, that's been a big thing. And the other factor is we lost Salem. Salem was going to be playing through the middle a little bit, uh, you know. So I just don't. I just don't buy that our midfield's down. Um, you know, we're not um, as str- we're not focused on midfields and clearances the way we have been um, because we're we're trying to implement a new method, which is transition from the back half, high turnover, and those numbers match like the Swans. So the Swans are the best at the moment from coming from the back half and Geelong as well. Geelong are way down below us on the stoppages and clearances. So really, you know, winning clearances is no longer um, or being a good clearance side is no longer sort of indicative of of a premiership team. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Scroll says, Track had a few luck last two weeks in the middle, goes forward and kicks a bag of five. Should we consider playing him up forward considering his recent midfield form and our uninspiring key forwards? Uh, another new poster on Demonland, Magnus. Uh, welcome, Magnus, and thanks for listening. Says, hi, Jens. Following on uh, from a comment the other week, uh, does our forward line lack a captain? Should we be considering making track a permanent leader of our forwards? I was very impressed watching him at the game, and he was pushing instructions to the other forwards to move into different positions, etc. Maybe he should split his time like we do with Cozzy. So, George, uh, what do you think about moving track forward on a permanent or semi-permanent basis? Uh, last year, uh, he went forward out of necessity, you know, due to the – we had injuries to key forwards. So we had to adjust uh, about the way we score. Uh, we don't have uh, a lack of tall personnel this season, but we've had to make an adjustment on the fly this week and it paid off. What do you think about uh, him moving there? Uh, I, I think we'll see – I think what we'll see is um, what was projected even a couple of years ago, moving him forward on a, it's not a permanent basis, but um, within the game. Um, you you probably noticed, um, you know, when Richmond were there at their height, they'd be playing Dustin Martin uh, in and out of the forward line and he was lethal. You know, I say he won two premierships out of the Richmond three, all off his own boot when he was playing forward in particular. Um, I think we'll see more of that of track. Our problem is you take track out of the middle <clears throat> to play forward. Who do you replace him with? Um, we haven't got a great um, uh, depth coming up behind, um, uh, and he's almost irreplaceable in any case. So um, I think think you'll see it tactically used uh, within the game, but not so much on a, on a permanent basis. Uh, I think we've got to solve our problem um, of long-term forwards. We might get a glimpse with Turner. Um, JVR's filling his role. Um, I don't know where, <coughs> what else we're going to have in the next year or two. Hopefully the Jefferson experiment works, um, that we don't have to move track forward to, to get the... Um, um, uh, the regular goal kickers, but I think you'll see him more as an impact player up forward as as needed. Um, we'll move on to the next one, uh, f- which I think we've discussed, so I don't think we need to to do it. Phil C, uh, uh, a big shout out to Wowie, uh, was very clean and composed, track elevated to another level, which is hard to, b- hard to believe. Super proud of that comeback, so I'm surprisingly calm. My question concerns the forward structure on TV. We seem to be very outnumbered in our forward 50 for most of the night. Were they uh, keeping numbers back or just tra- transitioning quickly? And I think, George, you mentioned uh, how they play man on man. So yeah, I yeah. could have given and, the impression that the it was everything was covered and it was full. Yeah, you know, and, and and their and their mid 
their mids move into the space in front as well, so it makes it very, very hard for the um, for our normal forwards and the movements to be able to get some sort of freedom up there. They got all credit to them. They, they, that was well thought out. And the other thing that they did, and they do a lot of, is they flooded back hard in that, particularly in that last quarter. Mm. But the other big factor, Andy, was we were seventy-one percent time in forward half in that last quarter. For instance, mm. that means the ball was continually re-entering into a super crowded forward line, so it's already crowded. It goes back out. We've set up the wall. It comes back in. So look at that last sort of two minutes of footy. You know, there were times there were forty. You know, for you know there were. Yeah. If it's 34, 35 players inside the, the arc. So, um, you know, that, that model was one of the reasons we're trying to shift away from it because you're always re-entering the ball into a crowded forward line. Lefty says uh, that's three games in a row against the Blues that insufficient goal review technology has uh, cost us the match. Uh, one day a team will lose a grand final as a result of Soviet-era tech. Uh, George... <laughs> We've spoken about uh, the inadequacies of the goal review technologies plenty of times, certainly in the podcast immediately after our two last games against uh, Carlton. Uh, here we are again. Uh, we know that technologies are currently being tested. Uh, in the meantime, we have to put up with the image quality of a disposable camera. I saw someone write on Team Land. Uh, I agree with Lefty. Mark my words. A uh, team will lose a, a grand final over this. Yeah, uh, ab- uh, absolutely. We've talked about this before and um, the, the very simple stuff, can we, is there any chance that we could get the cameras on both sides of the goal square, of the goal posts, for That's example? For the goal line. <laughs> yeah, so that you can see see whether it's gone through the points, whether it's hit, hit <laughs> yeah, you know, two more cameras would be, would be welcome. What was even more interesting, there was a comment on Demon Land, I think it was, it was today, um, in the Foots, in the Footscray Bull, Bulldogs game, um, where they were doing a goal review to see whether it had gone over the line or not, but they weren't looking at the fact that it was actually touched. Up. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so one camera was, was looking at... at, at um, whether the ball got over over the point, I think, or something like that. But it was obvious when they looked at the other, the next camera that had been touched, but they weren't looking at They didn't call for the review on whether it was touched or not. It was just oh, whether so it was over. If they f- find something else, they can't act upon it. <laughs> I th- well, they didn't in this game. But that's the, that's the sort of stupidity that we've got at the moment. I just wish we'd, in this, in this p- present period, that just let the goal umpires call be it. Just... Just leave it at that instead of going yeah. back and forth, back and forth. Um, um, and, and they're not reviewing the points. Uh, there was a couple in the uh, Port Adelaide-Geelong game where it was sus- suspected that goals had been kicked, but they were called points, but there's no review for points. File that one under my conspiracy theory. I don't reckon it's even a conspiracy theory anymore. If the AFL, it's another one that's deliberately – I mean, the technology – We've got the technology. You know, I mean, really, the, the the quality of cameras now. You know, for them not to be able to, for instance, be able to zoom in close enough on that Steve May one again. It was another example of something that happened right below me, and it was hilarious to see, uh, like Steve May's expressions. Like he was he was convinced, absolutely convinced. He was telling the players to set up for a point. And he was sort of, I mean, he looked a bit pantomime and, and played it up a bit, but he was, he looked legitimately shocked that it wasn't, um, that it wasn't awarded a point. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous, really. I mean, the technology's there for that one. They've, they've, you know, and as we've talked about, put the cameras in the post or again, change the rules to hit to the post and goes through. It doesn't matter for the, um, yep. for the point one. MPC says, for a team that prides itself on contest and defence, how come we seem to struggle in the rain? Um, we had Travi 14 earlier mentioned that uh, this was the best we had played in the wet for four years and now MPC is contending that we struggle in the rain. Hasn't rained for weeks and just our luck, the skies open up on uh, Thursday. Uh, at the end of the day, both teams do have to contend with the weather. So, Bim Man, uh, how do you think we handled the conditions as an improvement on some of the wet weather performances over the past uh, couple of years or games that we've played in the wet absolutely i mean a real pet hate a lot of uh, demons fans and uh, on demon land that's for sure is sort of the criticism of goody of not adapting our game plan for wet weather i mean and um 
I think that, you know, he's been bagged for that for ages. Uh, and I think this was an example, whether it's because of what we're talking about before, is that they decided to play a more aggressive forward half game because of, uh, you know, anaerobically we didn't have run in our legs and it, 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 were, it was smart to do so, or whether they did adapt. Um, the, the sort of reality is is that wet weather footy is traditionally ter- territory first, get it forward, deep inside 50, contest, contest after contest, lots of tackles, which is exactly what we did. So on this occasion, we did it, uh, did adapt, although I don't know about you guys, but we still, right from the beginning of the match, tried a lot of high-risk quick handballs that, you know, particularly in the first quarter, didn't come off. And a lot of them came unstuck, but, you know, those little flick hand pass and sort of chained up. But, you know, otherwise, it was a very much a sort of wet weather game. I thought that was our best game of footy in the wet. Maybe it, it's helped by having Billings, and by the way, <laughs> George Billings played. So um, I can't recall if we had a better, and I think it was dinner, wasn't it, that, uh, on Billings? No, that was only after the event you you added that part. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it's a function of having better kicks inside and, and more skill. You know, Langdon looks a different player this year. He looks like he's up and, and running and his kicking's improved out of sight. Um, so it was definitely, I think, our best performance in the weather. When the rain came, I thought, you know, the six goals down after two minutes of the third and the rain's coming down. I'm thinking, oh, my God, everything that could go wrong in this game is going wrong. The umpiring, the weather, the yeah, it was like, oh, my God. The, the my app, my weather app, said zero percent chance of rain. So right, yeah, I didn't know, and so that's the other thing about um, the planning for this game is that I was checking the weather all week, and they wouldn't have planned for a wet weather game. So I think that it was a good example of us either adapting because that's the game plan we came in with, or let's play credit to Goody and that he did adapt. It was the best we've played in the in the wet. We kicked, you know, we came back from a 38-point um, margin in the wets, no mean feat. Um, you know, we won th- that style of footy, that front-half footy, as I noted at, um, at the top in the stats file, you know, that was evidenced by winning the inside 50 count, territory battle, um, you know, winning time in forward half, winning the tackle counts. Um, but the other thing is it's a bit of a thing I think we need to consider this is that a key reason Goody doesn't like to make big big changes to his method, to our method week to week, is we're such a system-based team. But it's no small thing to play one way and then try to implement a new back half transition method um, and then flip to another, you know, method, even if it is, a, um, you know, even if it is previously a method that we've been using for the last two or three years. It's no, you know, that's no small thing to do that from a game one week to an, um, the next. Uh, and so, you know, it would have taken them a little while to sort of get used to that old system, if you like. Um, and and as you pointed out, the forecast was for no rain, so they wouldn't have planned it for it to be so wet. Likely not trained for it, um, and so I was shocked, as I said, but when it started raining before the game, I, I thought it was condensation coming off the grandstand roof because, you know, I wasn't even expecting rain. So. Um, you know, it, it rained for a big chunk of the game. Um, it, when it did dry up a little bit, we then sort of did revert to a bit of a halfback game. We tried to spread the ga- uh, the ground a bit more. We w- were sort of switching across the ground. We bounced off halfback better, uh, and we w- reverted to sort of a hybrid forward half game and, and a little bit of that sort of element that, you know, we did against the Cats and that that's transition game is probably evidenced by, you know, 26 points from the defensive half is not – huge amount under our season average. NPC chimes in again with uh, something that caught my ear in the interview with Max on the club website. He mentioned we have struggled uh, the past few times against big Melbourne clubs, assuming Carlton and Collingwood. I find we play really well in interstate hostile environments. However, when it's our home ground, but we are outnumbered by the louder opposition crowd, I wonder if it's a mental thing that plays on the player's mind at all, like big club envy, even at a subconscious level. Do you think there is anything to it? Uh, Well, we've got a wonderful record on the road in recent years playing in front of some extremely hostile crowds. You only have to go back a few rounds to see the two Adelaide games. Uh, George, surely crowds in Melbourne isn't a factor to explain away uh, losses to bigger Melbourne clubs. I, I don't think so. I think the, looking at uh, this this through the uh, benefit of recent recent uh, positions, Carlton and Collingwood happen to have been pretty good sides. <laughs> There's a reason why we we might be seen to struggle against them. It's because it will be a good game. Uh, it will be a close game. They're good sides. So um, the crowd factor, I think, is more more important in the way that it influences umpires, particularly mm-hmm. about not calling. Um, 
certain ways. Um, uh, the um, I was watching a game recently. I was I was in Adelaide. It was an Adelaide game. Um, I can't remember who was playing, um, but the number of times that that calls were simply not made because the the crowd was silent when it should have been holding the ball uh, against their home side. So, um, yeah, I think that's the only influence that, that happens. But uh, I don't think we're overawed at all by by uh, who we're playing. It just happens that in recent times, they've been pretty good sides, the big ones. The only thing I'd say is that if, I mean, so for another close loss to the Blues. <laughs> mm. But if you look at, um, not the final because we started well, but if you look at, say, the last three games against... The um, the last one against the Pies and and the last home and away season game or the last two home and away season games against the Blues in all three games they jumped us at the beginning and perhaps it's partly to do with you know Miss Bargonagas's um, um, sort of discussion around how we sort of ease into the game and and teams are sort of alert to that and they looking to jump us um and you know but th- this game was almost the carbon copy if you go back to the the infamous point game um you know where it was touched not touched against the blues last year it was equally you know funny night wet tough physical game um, that, you know, we ended up grinding it out. I reckon I'd, I meant to go back and look at it, but I suspect the numbers are almost identical on things like time and forward half and tackles. And, you know, we dominated the last three quarters of that game. It was identical in this game, or it was actually the second half in this game. Um, but, in all, you know, three of the last four games against the Pies and the Blues, we've had a shocking start. Um, so, you know, it's obviously something that they'd be looking to address. We don't want to have to start a final four or five goals down. Oh, you're on board with uh, me not wanting that to happen to us in the final. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I've forgotten <laughs> that I said that. <laughs> but just in case, have we, there's not a question about track. I mean, what a game by track. Oh, and I just wanted to say one of the – He goes forward, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah one of the funniest things of uh, the footy for a long, long time and, and – where I was sitting, we were on level two behind the goals at, um, at in the Shane Warm stand at the punt road end. And there was a Carlton fan almost directly above us, not quite above us, but around a bit, who was yelling like at the top of his lung, young lungs, like so loud you couldn't believe it. It was amazing that he got through the whole match. But for two hours of game time, he was yelling, screaming like so loud that everyone could hear it, Christian, you suck. And I'm sure there's listeners who could hear it, but like literally, like screaming it so loud, Christian, you suck. And people were, even Blues fans were yelling at him to shut up. And But it was actually ended up being quite funny because Christian Petrarca went bananas and it was right below us. I, I think three of his goals were directly below us and a couple of them were directly after he was screaming, Christian, you suck. It was like the one of the best individual games from a player of... It would be right up there in my top 100 of individual games. It was incredible by Petrarca. So it was quite comical because, you know, he clearly didn't suck. Um, but it was quite a bizarre a bizarre experience. And and the other thing I had to say about the Blues fans is that they should be called the Boos fans. Oh. I mean, they just were booing free kicks for the entire match. And it was like – and it does my head in when people boo – like call holding the ball when a player kicks it or handballs it. <laughs> It's just so frustrating. Uh, Jane 2 says, Hi, guys. Very disappointed with the result and ordinary umpiring, but impressed with the team's comeback in the last quarter. My question is, in retrospect, was it an error to bring back Bowie uh, back in after such a long layoff? I haven't been able to determine if he wasn't quite right or if he was subbed off as he was having no impact. Uh, also very impressed with Wo Woden's performance. Surely getting a full game into him next week is the way to go. Keep up the great work. Your podcast get me through my long drive to Melbourne each week and always lots of good food for thought. So, B-Man, your thoughts on ba- Jake Bowie's game? Uh, last week I accidentally left out a question that we had about Wowie and how he had risen to the task of playing in defence after he was thrust into that position in the absence of Salem and Bowie. Uh, well, so did we rush Jake back? This week, given his eight-week layoff, and considering that Wowie has been uh, growing into that halfback role, um, look, I'd say no. I mean, I listened to as I was sitting in the drizzling rain at the, at the game. McWalter was um, um, interviewed 
uh, on the radio beforehand and was asked ex- you know, exactly that question of you, what, you're rushing him back eight weeks and he said, no, he's good to go. We, won't, we don't bring anyone back who's not good to go. So, you know, he, they knew all of his numbers. He had met all his targets. They were 100% confident he was good to go. But as I said, you know, part of our philosophy is we brought back Petty um, when he was clearly not 100%, exactly the same with Oliver when he was, wasn't 100%. It's, you know, the, it's the one of the sort of themes of or, or one of the common practices of our high-performance program is um, I, I suspect a big part of the thinking was, I mean, he's a he's – a, excellent player he's an elite ball user um you just need your best players in t- in footy if you want to have a litmus test you've got to have your best players in the team and he's such an important player with his ability particularly with Salem out you know you can't rely on Judd McVie being the um one player in the back half who is an elite kick we need three um uh, two or three and and Bow is definitely one of them I actually haven't looked at his numbers how how well he played doesn't surprise me he got subbed off um, so, you know, I, I, it's hard to say that it was – they wouldn't have brought him in if they didn't think he was ready would be my feeling um, or that he didn't think he could make a contribution. Um, I don't know about you guys. He looked okay to me. I'm, I didn't even check his numbers, to be honest. The, the only thing I'd add was um, watching it on the television, he looked quite distressed when he was subbed off, physically um, distressed, like, right. like he'd done something to the shoulder again or the collarbone or um, – right. Um, it might have got a stinger. It might have got it? something. Yeah, so um, I can't add anything more more than that. Yeah, I wasn't I mean, the other thing too about bringing him in his fresh legs. I mean, one of the, I before the game, I said I wrote on Demonland that I don't bet on these games, but if I was advising a neutral, it would be just leave this game well alone because there's just too many variables. One of which is the you know they brought four players in. Will that help them with their freshness, given the you know their their recent um, compressed schedule? One, what's the influence of Bowie? One of the other variables is what's you know the influence of the umpire is going to be. What's luck going to be? Um, what tactical approach? So you know, I, it's hard to say really, isn't it? Was the right thing? I mean, he's a better player than um, uh, Wowie at this stage of his career. So you know, if he's fit and they think he's ready to go, you get you know bring him in all day, every day. Mind you, when when Woe came on, I was rather impressed with him. He he yeah. was clean with the ball, um, providing. That's true, and it's quite providing. physically sort of dynamic, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, what what was interesting? We'll talk about the Casey game, but he played the next day um, mm. for Casey, which which was remarkable. I don't know why they've done that. I Load management, George. I absolutely don't know why. After playing a quarter and uh, well, uh, for that reason, to get yeah, the loads up. Yeah, but um, interesting. Oh, my D says, I was really impressed by Langdon's game. Uh, was used differently than usual by Goody, given track played mostly forward, but I thought he was a really effective. So I, I reckon Langdon's almost back to his 2021 best. Uh, you know, ever since when we mentioned it a while back, since he's cracked ribs, I think 10 rounds into 2022, he struggled to be as effective uh, as he was in the premiership season. Uh, and then when Hunter arrived on the scene, he had to change to a more defensive uh, role. Uh, but I think this season we're seeing a lot of similarities uh, in the way that he's used uh, as in 2021, George. Yeah, ab- absolutely. The, this, this is uh, Ed Langdon back to his absolute best. He seems to be in everything at both ends of the ground, which is exactly what his major benefit is over other wingers in the competition. He, he's just relentless. Um, uh, you really can't add any more any more than that. You know, the number of times that he saves goals down one end and he seems to be at the other end um, um, contributing to forward thrusts. He's just, just remarkable. Um uh, I don't know if he was on Holland's, but he certainly gave gave uh, him, I think, a, a bit of a bath in terms of uh, how a winger should play, although Holland still plays pretty well. But, uh, yeah, all credit to, to Ed. I think we're seeing the best of him, uh, having come back from those, that uh, rib injury. And once again, um, people shouldn't underestimate the... the um, effects of injury on particular players and in his case someone who who's a runner having his ribs cracked uh, doesn't do him very much good but uh, now that he's overcome that uh, certainly back to his best it's a good point i mean 
it's a, an excellent point. I mean, he was just not the same player uh, last year, was he? And I agree, Andy. He's back to his very best. And what I really like is his kicking had fell away completely last year after pumping. I was pumping him up big time in twenty two, um, but he's you know after that rib injury, sort of he's he was never quite the same player. But also his kicking fell away. But his kicking's been um, excellent um, so far this season again, uh, and smart. Uh, you know those he, so often it's like a Langdon special where he gets trapped on the boundary, but his ability to put it back, you know, sort of laterally towards the goal square is sort of almost like a Langdon signature now. And uh, his running power, just watch him for ten minutes, put the binos on him, and just watch him. He's incredible. Let's get into um, uh, very quickly through the Casey game because from all the reports, I I didn't watch it. I've got a brief summary here, but it uh, sounded like it was quite unwatchable. In a gruelling and excruciating to watch match that could have easily ended in a tie, the Casey Demon secured a narrow victory over Carlton. Young forward Matt Jefferson opened the scoring while Carlton Thaltrop's uh, mid-quarter two-goal burst, uh, including a remarkable one from long range, was crucial. Skipper Mitch White also stood out particularly with a pivotal goal before halftime. Carlton, on the other hand, relied heavily on just a couple of standout players who drove most of their game. And despite trailing early, Casey managed to come back thanks to a Bailey Laurie, uh, thanks to Bailey Laurie and a consistent game from Lockie Hunter, who alongside Adam Tomlinson topped the team with 24 disposals each. Ben Brown emerged as a second half hero for Casey, although his kicking was inconsistent. His efforts contributed significantly to the total booting two goals, six the match itself turned into a low-scoring, tough contest by the end with Casey pulling ahead to clinch the win by three points. George, did you watch any of the game? Yeah, I watched, <laughs> watched about half the game, game and a few of the highlights. One of the most boring games you could possibly watch. It was it was awful, not surprising. This was VFL level, uh, 15th on the ladder versus 17th, I think. I think it were. Well, they're, they're 17th or 15th. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I read, I, I think they only had two or three yeah, they AFL some, listed players two, or something. Two AFL listed players. I think we had seven. But uh, it was just an awful game game to watch. It was just mistake after a mistake. Um <clears throat> The uh, Ben Brown two goal six normally would have kicked six goals two because most of those shots were Ben Brown's Brown specials. You know the forty five meter run up uh, kicking from forty, he just kept on missing him. He didn't seem to be able to to to, um, to put him through the middle. Um, interestingly, Shacky didn't play at all in this game. Well, he he was uh, named in the injury list last week uh, as a with an Achilles as a test. Ah, so he pulled out of the week before, and we weren't sure whether that was a holdover, just in case. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, break, blah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah. But uh, he was in the injury report as an Achilles for a test, so I'm assuming he didn't get over that test. No, uh, no. What was interesting, though, was I think that freed up Jefferson uh, a lot more. Um, instead of having you know, Fullerton, Shacky, uh, Ben Brown uh, competing in the forward line for him, but... Jefferson certainly played a better game uh, this time. Still a long way from it, but that's what he needs in um, in terms of his development. Hunter, lots and lots and lots of possessions. Didn't really have a great deal of influence in the game, unfortunately, from what I saw. Um, if you're playing playing a team that's 17th, you should be really cutting it right up to pieces. And um, With no yeah. AFL-listed players. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. So, so you really couldn't take much away from this this game. Tolstrup, I thought, was good in patches, really good. You could see the talent there. Um, yeah. There was a couple of goals that um, you know, he, he was the result. He started it in the middle or started it further up the field to be able to score. Mitch White won the game for them, absolutely. Um, turned it around um, with a couple of really telling possessions. Um, but... Um, uh, we're, we're not going to do much uh, in this season as the VFL side simply because um, we're missing all those good second-tier plays that we um, lost from the previous years. Um, probably White's one of the few decent ones remaining when we lost. Uh, Moose and, and uh, a couple of others, Bell, for ex- um, as, as examples. But, um, yeah, they're well down, well down from where they were. Where and the, you take out Dunstan, Dun- uh, yeah, yeah. JJ, yeah. James Harms. James Harms, uh, yeah. You know, yep. And then the guys like Howes, the guys that have made the step up into the... Uh, That's correct, you know, yeah. JBR's not there anymore. Uh, yep. Howes, uh, Woden, Laurie are out, in and out. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, two, not- two comments and a question. That, that, well, go the questions first is um, I guess the players that 
you know, Jefferson's the one that a lot of people are focusing on in terms of, you know, will he come good? You know, it's good to hear that he's been a bit more um, in the game in the last couple of weeks. But leaving him aside, George, there's two players. So this is the comment and then the follow-up question is that two players that concern me in terms of, uh, you know, where they're travelling, but, uh, you know, they're important players uh, or should be important players for us um, given the roles they play, but they're not going to that next level, which really worries me, uh, is Seston and Moniz Wakefield. Um, how did they go? Um, Seston, it's almost the same as last couple of weeks. Shows that shows a few things here and there. Um, I don't think he, when he first arrived at the club, I don't think he had any tank whatsoever. Um, and he's had to, had to really build. Um, he's playing midfield. I don't know if, if that's his best role necessarily. Um, and he's not going to be able to break into the midfield in the seniors in any case. You know, I might just want to get him near the ball. And Yeah. Um, but because we've lost the people like the Dunstons and the Harms and that in this side, he's being forced to play in the middle. Um, he's doing all right. Um, um, he's, he's, I, I think he's got enough basics there to be able to build something, but it, it won't be this year that he's going to break out by any stretch. Um, who was the other one? The, uh, uh, the other a, oh, AMW. Um, I, I just don't know what they're going to do with him. It, it's He... He, he seems to get a lot of the ball but not really have a, any influence on the game. Um, I mean, he's, he came in as a small forward option yeah. and, and we need a second, you know, well, I mean, we've got sort of relatively good co- coverage but a sort That's of right. Cosy style close to goal small forward. Yeah, um, from, from what I've seen, they're playing him more across the half-back line. Yeah. Um, they are at the moment, yeah. Yeah, so, um, again, where do you fitting you in, you know? I don't know that he's going to fit into the half back line or the or the forward line at this stage, but um, yeah, difficult to say. All right. Uh, well, given it's a Sunday uh, and at the, the time of recording, we haven't heard from the club or our high performance manager in terms of any injuries, except one we heard on the news tonight. Uh, JVR has entered concussion protocols uh, and will not be playing uh, in Perth this week. Um, so we know he's not going to play. So that's one change. We so when did that happen? In that, the match, presumably. Yeah. What yeah. you said during the match, he's... Yeah, he's Channel 9 showed, showed it. I think it was um, he, he came came out of the goal square to try to take a diving mark and hit, I think it was fine his knee. Right. Uh, um, and then obviously after the game, he's had, had symptoms of some sort. What quarter was that in, George? Oh, I don't know. I think it was. He was off the ground for ages, and I thought he'd been subbed off because he yeah. was off the ground so long. So I wonder whether he was having the um, HIA test or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, he's out. He's out for the next twelve days at least. Right. Um, so that's him. Salem was listed last week as still one to two weeks away, and given that he's recovering from a hamstring injury, I think we can safely assume that he won't be uh, travelling to Perth. Um, so, given all that, um, uh, and after our second five-day break in five or so weeks, we now have a 10-day break uh, from last Thursday till next Sunday. Uh, what changes, boys, uh, or if, if any? Uh, well, we know there has to be one. JVR is yeah. not going to be playing. Other demons likely to make uh, Big Man followed by George, who comes in. Well, I was going to go with no change for sure, um, but obviously JVR. That's interesting because that's a problem, isn't it? But mm. Is it? Um, we need a second ruck. Is this you know, George's? I haven't watched hardly any of Casey. I have to say, the obvious one, just from what George has said in terms of um, performance in the last few weeks, is Varel to come in. Um, you know, I think this is probably would be a great opportunity. Um, we can't be flogging Maxi for ninety percent. You know, this is. I mean, although he loves to, McWalter said that in that interview, is that he's a player who just loves to be in the ruck all the time and you're not dragging him out of there. But, you know, Petty didn't take a single um, centre square bounce. It was all JVR in this game. Uh, Petty took, I think, six or seven um, or five or six uh, around the ground stoppages. But he's he's got no technique in the middle. So, you know, um, I can't see them using him, to be honest, as the second ruck. They might. Um You've got to bring in a, another forward. It's not going to be Shaki if he's not um, playing. It's definitely not going to be Jefferson um, yet, is it? So, uh, you know, who who does that leave? I'm not entirely sure. I, I guess you ben, could ben bring Brown. Tomo in or Ben Brown. You know, there you go. But you could bring Ben Brown. But it still doesn't solve the second ruck no, dilemma, no. does it? No. Um, 
you could bring um, Tomlinson back in and throw uh, T Mac forward potentially. Uh, it still, again, leaves the dilemma about who the second ruck. So maybe you know, maybe this is the perfect opportunity to bring Varel in and um, have him play forward. That's uh, where he's been. He's resting forward, isn't he? At case he's rucking and resting forward. Yep. Yep. Um, it doesn't sound like Fullerton is no, and, really in and, the frame at the moment, to be honest. But, but I don't know the ins and outs, but at the end of the game, in the very last minute, Fullerton, they said, might have done a knee injury of some sort. Right. Well, he wasn't mentioned in the uh, – well, I'm not sure in the – was he mentioned an injury, uh, Andy? Not in the not in the injury report, but not in the match report. But that doesn't. Uh, but he ha- he hasn't been doing enough, has he? No, no, I haven't seen him. But that's from what I read on Demon Land. He hasn't been. He hasn't made a case for senior selection. So yeah, it'd be shocking if it was. He- I'd be shocked if it was him. Would you? Th- could you see them? Varel coming in, George? Yeah, and um, West Coast don't have a strong rucking division as well. So that's it's a perfect opportunity, I think, if they were to do that, go that way. But uh, Ben Brown's the obvious. Um, easy forward replacement, but you know, who do we do we need the second ruck, or do you just you know pinch hit with a T Mac every now pinch and then? Pinch hit with a T Mac, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess you're right. Probably the logical thing would be Ben Brown if they think 10 days between this game, plenty of you know, yeah. Although, do they want to put the big fella on a, on a plane and fold him into a pretzel? I don't know, but yeah, um, the other, know, I'd yeah. love to see Varel get a run. Yeah. You know, it's always great to see juniors. The other thing is McGovern uh, was hurt today. I'm not sure if he's going to come up, but he was well, a bit proppy. Uh, yeah, well, let's yeah. just start yeah. the preview bit and then you guys can add in. Uh, George told me there were a few players for the Eagles that uh, might not be playing. The Ds will travel interstate for the third time this season when they travel to Perth to play the Eagles at our home away from home Optus Stadium, the site of our drought-breaking flag, despite a few close Games, a few close competitive games and back-to-back victories in mid-April. The Eagles uh, were widely tipped to join the Kangaroos as cellar dwellers this season and uh, have, have been very inconsistent this year and have had a few thumpings. Uh, and to add insult to injury, they have a large injury list. Uh, it will be very concerning if the Demons don't dispatch the Eagles with ease. But stranger things have happened, uh, George, followed by B-Man, your preview of the match, uh, from George, you, you have some uh, updates on their, their injury yeah. list. Um, I, I watched the Eagles Collingwood game today. It was um, a bit like witches' hats, uh, quite frankly. Um, Collingwood at the, it's quite the first goal, Eagles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Collingwood by the end of the game had one player on the bench, um, so they were they were down three players effectively, and. Um, um, so they still convincingly overran them. Eagles were in it for a, a quarter, um, uh, but um, Collingwood were just sim- simply far too good for them. Um, they, they already had Waterman out, <coughs> who's still listed one to two weeks. Yo was out this week, one to two weeks. Um, so th- th- both of those would be doubtful perhaps for next week. McGovern um, was taken to hospital with... Um, they. C- Call the internal injuries, but I suspect it's um, broken ribs. Um, it says here, I'm just reading internal injury. It's like a <laughs> broken heart. I've had one of them before. <laughs> um, he, he basically landed on his own arm after going up for a mark. Um, looked like he's broken the ribs from the. Um, uh, okay. Darling um, might be subject to an MRO review because he um, ran into a. Well, a broken nose, but he also um, ran into um, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, one of the Collingwood players. I can't remember who was concussed as a result of the concl- uh, the uh, collision. So it'll be interesting to see whether he has a question to answer there. Petrocelli did an ankle as the well. Detective. Yep. Um, so that's you know, potentially three more players out of their side that was already um, decimated. Um, I can't see them to, to, them um, being any any real threat, but for this game, it might be an opportunity for us. You know, do we give uh, Windsor a break um, with a ten day break? Salem must be very close in any case, and it, uh, maybe that's an opportunity to bring him back in uh, as well. Um, so, we're Woden for Bowie, Bowie for we're Woden. That's a it's a fine line, isn't it, between paying respect to opposition and, um, you know, taking the opportunity to 
the other thing they can do is to, you know, speaking of load management, is that even someone like Clary, they could, you know, use this break to um, 10 days, you know, maybe they could load up the players in this period and almost, you know, it would be disrespectful to call it by. But the thing that West Coast have been good at in the last few weeks is their contest. Like they're number two or something in the AFL for ground ball gets. Their contest has been great um, for most games, um, but it just completely fell away by the look of it in that game, George. I didn't uh, like Howes was off, uh, uh, How was off groin for the Pies. They got a concussion. So that, as you say, they had three on the bench, um, three out. So, you know, for that game to be a blowout is a bad sign for um, Eagles. But when you take out the sort of the players that they've lost from that team anyway, but the sort of concern would be their their contest fell away. But mm. uh, at home, they'll they'll come out. They'll be they'll fo- they'll be focused on the contest. I'm really hoping it's an opportunity for us to see us playing out sort of a high octane transition game, and hopefully we can really take that opportunity to sort of practice under match conditions, fast transition from the back half with McVie and um, and hopefully Bowie delivering the ball out of the back half, and uh, you know really sort of getting on our bikes. You know, percentages. Uh, you know, you talk about um, the the end of the year, uh, Andy. It was massive from a percentage perspective. We wouldn't be fourth if we didn't fight back from thirty eight points. We would be fifth, um, and so we get the one crack at West Coast. Speaking of playing teams once, um, and you know, we want to take advantage of it. And we played them twice. No, oh, do we play them twice? I think we well, play. That'd be brilliant if we get to play them. So I just assumed actually. I we'll um, play them again in Melbourne. Right. Well, that's great. I mean, so to. You know, if they're weakened at the moment, don't just rack up a high score, as I've talked about tons of times, is the best way to get a high percentage is to keep the opposition to the lowest score as possible uh, and win by a big margin, not to score as much as you can and, and create an open, free-flowing game where both teams score. We want to keep them under 30, 40 points uh, and then hopefully score 100-plus points ourselves. Um Looking forward to it. It's a bit weird, though, isn't it? Because Thursday night, and we're not playing till Sunday week at six pm. It's like um, I'm really looking forward to getting this sort of um, group of games out of the way, or the first nine, ten games out of the way. Because after that, we go back to week to week for a while, and I'm looking forward to a bit better rhythm than Thursday nights. I'm I'm not a fan of Thursday night football. I've decided it uh, um, throws out the weekend, and I'm not a massive fan of a six pm. Um, Optus game, but at least we'll have something to to look forward to over the weekend. So we play the Eagles uh, at the MCG in round 17. Uh, it's the first time we will have played the Eagles at the MCG since uh, when? Oh, since a game that I remember oh. where we got beaten by. Yeah, we did. <laughs> oh, God, God Andy, what is it? 2014. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting late to that game and they were already three goals up. Well, that was almost another time where we didn't score in the first quarter. We scored one point in the first quarter. <laughs> I don't think they were that good that year either, were they? I don't know, 2014. Uh, so we've out. forgotten that. We've erased those years from our memories. Uh, the, yeah. the forecast is, um, I'm not sure why my computer's showing um, Fahrenheit, but it's 80 degrees okay. Fahrenheit on on, on Sunday when we play them. Minimum 15. Uh, it's 27 during the day, but then by the time we play them, I think it's 4 o'clock their time. It's down to about 24 and it's cloudy. Uh, I think oh, it's perfect. Yeah, it won't be any dew. There will be no, oh, oh, and it says here, slight chance of a shower. I didn't have it. Said no precipitation on my app, but then again, my app uh, last week let me down. Yeah, well, um, I'm looking at bomb. It says partly cloudy, slight chance of a shower, winds northeasterly, 15 to 25 kilometres, chance of any rain, 20%. 15 mm-hmm. minimum, 26 maximum. 6 p.m., what time is it over there? Be four, can, four, four, 10. Four. I think it works that way. <laughs> All right, boys, um, we're going to leave it there uh, for tonight. We'll be back next week. If you want to listen to the show live, uh, please head on over to demonland.com on Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Thank you to our five-star reviewer on Apple Podcasts. Thank you, uh, Feline Phobe. Uh, thank you to our um, – our posters on Demonland who submitted uh, questions and comments. They're an integral part of the show. So thank you to Monocular, uh, Palace D, Smurf, a Demonic Final Fantasy, Travi 14, D, Old Fart, Radish D, Lazy, What What Say What, Lakeside Oval, Bigfoot, Bidman's PA, D 
demonstrative at the break of Gorn Scroll, Phil C, Lefty, MPC, Jano 2 and Oh My D's. And thank you to my uh, two co-hosts, uh, George and B-Man. Thank you to uh, you, our loyal listeners. And don't forget, leave us a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts. And we'll read it out on next week's show. Go Demons. Go Red Leggers. <laughs> <laughs>